Good morning. I'm Vince Smith, Director of AEI's Agricultural Studies Program and Professor of Economics for two whole more days at Montana State University. It's a genuine pleasure to welcome uh, everyone, whether you're in, here in person or whether you're with us online uh, uh, or watching on C-SPAN. Uh, the American Enterprise Institute is wonderfully privileged to be able to welcome you here uh, for this important discussion of the state of the US farm economy and considerations about what that state means for the 2023 Farm Bill debates that are emerging right now. Today, we have two panels of distinguished researchers and policy analysts. Speakers in the first panel will focus on the objective evidence about the current overall financial state of the US agricultural sector and prospects for the next three or four years. Speakers in the second panel will delve more deeply into the situation of different types of farms, small versus medium versus large, farms producing large acre crops like corn and wheat versus other crops such as fruits and vegetables and that then livestock. In each panel, two discussants will explore the relevance and potential implications of the state of the farm economy in the context of the emerging debate over the 2023 Farm Bill. And each panel uh, will include a short discussion of the issues by the panelists and discussants, along with uh, a longer session for questions from the audience. For questions from folks who are here in person, uh, please raise your hand when called upon. AI staff will bring you a, mi uh, a mic so that uh, you can be heard both in the room and by uh, people live streaming the event. Um, for questions from folks here in person, just raise your hand, as I said. Uh, if you're live streaming and we would like to submit questions, you can do that too by email to benjamin.goren, G-O-R-E-N, at A-E-I dot O-R-G. Or you can uh, communicate via Twitter to hashtag A-E-I Farm Bill. I serve as moderator of the first panel, Dr. Joseph Glauber, AI non-resident senior fellow and senior fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, will moderate and introduce the members of the second panel. It's my pleasure to introduce the distinguished members of the first panel. Our first speaker will be Kerry Latowski, senior economist and program leader on the farm economy branch at the USDA Economic Research Service. Her focus will be on the recent sector-wide farm income estimates for 2022 and 2023. Dr. Nate Kaufman uh, will be our second spe speaker. He is senior vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, and he will share insights about current and future potential changes in the financial condition of the farm sector. At least that's what I believe. Um, Dr. Patrick Westhoff is Director of the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute and the Howard Corden Professor of Agricultural and Applied Economics at the University of Missouri. His focus will be on possible scenarios for the evolution of sector-wide farm income. Uh, we have two discussants. The first is Dr. Susan Office, who served as Chief Economist at the, Uni at, sorry, at the U.S. General Accounting Office from 2007 until her retirement in 2015. And before that, for a decade, she was the administrator of the USDA Economic Research Service. Our second discussant is Joshua Sewell, Senior Policy Analysis Analyst for Taxpayers for Common Sense, where he has been addressing agricultural policy issues for the past 15 years through several painful farm bills. Um, we're so fortunate to have such a knowledgeable panel. Now let's welcome uh, Mrs. Ms. Carrie Lukowski to talk about farm income estimates. Thank you, Vince. Well, I'm pleased to have this opportunity today to talk about the ERS or USDA farm income forecasts. We put these forecasts out and estimates three times a year. And these come from the February 7th release, so earlier this month. And the goal of the program is to measure 
forecasts and explain the drivers behind changes in the farm sector economy. I'm going to go right to the charts. We have two measures of farm sector profitability or net farm income. And after strong growth in the past two years, we are forecasting that in 2023, net farm income and net cash farm income will fall in 2023. Specifically, net cash farm income is forecast to fall when inflation adjusted about 23%. That would put it at still relatively high level. In 2022, we're forecasting that net cash farm income was at its highest level ever. Net farm income in 2022 is forecast to be at its highest level since 1977 and then to fall 18% in 2023. Note, both measures are expected to remain above their average for the past two decades in 2023 and even remain above their 2021 level. This shows how we get from 2022. It's a forecast still. We'll convert it to an estimate in August 31st. But how we get from the forecast for 2022 to the forecast for 2023. And those bars in orange are the ones that are contributing to lower income, and the ones in blue would contribute to higher. So really, a lot of it comes down to lower cash receipts. Crop cash receipts are forecast to fall about $9 billion. We do make an adjustment for changes in inventories because in the net farm income measure, we're trying to get at income for current production only. Livestock or animal and animal product cash receipts are forecast to fall about $15 billion. Also contributing to the decline in 2023 are production expenses, which are forecast to rise $18 billion. So we subtract those out. That's why higher expenses with lower income. And then additionally, government payments are forecast to fall $5 billion in 2023. We could go a little bit deeper in, into cash receipts. Note that for total cash receipts, they were forecast at a record high in 2022 largely due to higher commodity prices. And when we start with crop cash receipts, we're expecting many commodities to have lower cash receipts. These are calendar year receipts due to lower prices. So corn, soybeans, cotton, fruits and nuts, vegetables, all those on this chart here are forecast to decline in 2022, sorry, 23, but wheat receipts are forecast to increase slightly in 2023. On the animal and animal product side, it's a similar story. Most commodities saw really high receipts in 2022, but are forecast to fall in 2023. Uh, cattle and calves, when inflation adjusted, as this chart is done, is forecast to be relatively stable receipts in 2023, while dairy, broilers, hogs, and eggs are all forecast to see declines. Direct government payments, these are payments that are made to farm operators by the federal government, usually from farm programs. And these are forecast to continue to decline in 2023. You see that spike in 2020 uh, where government payments reached a record high, largely because of USDA and non-USDA pandemic assistance payments that were made to producers. Uh, after that, they have, the government payments have declined each year since as those payments, these pandemic assistance related payments have slowed or were reduced. In 2022 and 23, the biggest portion of those bars are the gray bar. And these are all other payments. And they largely reflect what we call uh, ad hoc and supplemental uh, disaster assistance. We saw an increase of about 8 billion in 2022 and then going down um, about $6 billion in 2023. And this is a accumulation of a bunch of different programs like um, the Livestock Forage Program, the Emergency Livestock Relief Program, the Emergency Relief Program. So a lot of these ad hoc assistants are expected to be make up the core of government payments in 2022 and 2023. Expenses. Uh, they, had a, they increased a record amount, dollar amount, in 2022 as commodity prices, sorry, input prices that farmers paid for their production inputs increased for many items. This chart looks 
at the individual expense items for different types of spending or categories of spending across 2021, 2022, and 2023. So those above the line, we expect to see higher spending in 2023. At the top is interest expenses. We're expecting the largest dollar increase for this item as debt is forecast to increase into 2023 and interest rates are forecast to in, uh, increase in 2023. Livestock and poultry and labor are also forecast to continue to increase in 2023. Among those with lower spending, uh, particularly fertilizer and feed, we do expect that they will decline in 2023, but they're gonna remain relatively high. As you can see in 2022, both of those categories had a strong growth, and we think that will level off a bit or decline, especially in the case of feed in 2023. On the farm sector jet balance sheet, we get some information about the physical and financial assets debt that are held by the farm sector as a whole. And farm sector assets, debt, and equity are all forecast to increase in 2023. But you can see that the equity position is still strong. In fact, we're forecasting that in 2023, farm equity will reach $4 trillion for the first time. One thing that perhaps you can't really tell from this chart though is that debt is forecast to increase at a higher rate. The percentage growth is greater than that than for assets. So when you look at something like the debt to asset or the debt to equity ratio, you, there's a slight worsening of those ratios, but overall equity is forecast to grow. This is my last chart. I just kind of give you an indication of what we think might happen geographically by region. Here we're gonna only look at farm businesses. So this is just a subset of all farms. There are farms where the primary occupation of the operator is farming, plus farms that have $350,000 or more uh, in gross cash farm income. So these are about 50% of all farms, but they contribute the most to the value of ag sector production. And all regions of the country, we have nine regions here, are expected to see lower average net cash farm income in 2023, with the Northern Crescent expected to see the largest decline. And that's largely reflecting dairy in that region, because we're, as I may have noticed earlier, we're forecasting a fairly large declining dairy receipts in 2023, largely due to lower prices in 2023. So that's just a brief snapshot. I encourage you to check out our website for more, and we're gonna update these forecasts again on August 31st. So thank you. Well, thank you, Kerry. Uh, we now turn to Dr. Kaufman, who for many years has been monitoring the financial state of the agricultural sector in the United States. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Vince, and thank you to AEI for the invitation. I'm pleased to be able to be here this morning. Um, I don't have shot slides to be able to share this morning because I want to keep my comments at a pretty high level and, and conversational to the extent that I can. Just a quick word, as our audience may not be familiar with why someone from the Federal Reserve might be here talking about agriculture, and just to kind of level set that quickly, the Federal Reserve, as many people may know, is the central bank for the United States, but the way we are structured is to have regional offices scattered throughout the country. Located here in Washington, D.C., you'll see that we have the office of the Board of the Governors, but as you move across the country, there are regional reserve banks that are tasked with representing those regions. I come from the Kansas City Fed, where a large part of the region that we cover does have a strong concentration in agriculture. We have a lot of financial institutions that are connected to agriculture. So uh, to Vince's comment there, this is one of the primary reasons that we've tracked conditions in ag for a long time. So I wanna, I wanna keep my comments relatively brief, but I'm gonna organize them in a few ways. The first is that I wanna start just by recognizing and, and picking up on some of the things that Kerry mentioned, um, a little bit of the context coming into where we are right now. I do wanna focus then a bit more on financial conditions and, and credit conditions specifically. And I'll end with just my very brief assessment of where I think there are some risks that we'll wanna be aware of, especially as we start talking about some of those things that might connect back to credit conditions and finance. So the first thing that I wanna start with is just recognizing again, where we were prior to the pandemic, where things have been the last couple of years, and that is important context to how we see envi the environment right now. Um, let's keep in mind to start with, before the pandemic, we would have been describing agriculture as in a more precarious place. 
Commodity prices had been low for a relatively long time. Profit margins were relatively thin. And at a time when we had been talking about the broader US economy enjoying one of its longest expansions on record, we were talking about conditions in agriculture gradually deteriorating. We were seeing, again, gradual but persistent increases in financial stress. We were starting to see some increases in bankruptcies. There were concerns looking ahead at the beginning of 2020 about what that might portend going forward. There wasn't something specific prior to the pandemic that, would have, that we would have thought that we were going to see those conditions change. So that was the context coming into the pandemic, but as Kerry noted, we saw some of the highest farm incomes that we've seen in a very long time from 2020 through 2022, and now the expectation in 2023 is maybe a bit lower, but still very, very high. So that's important context for a couple of reasons. One is that, again, going into the pandemic, there was this gradual increase in financial stress and, again, concerns, and this would have happened during a time of previous negotiations of a farm bill that looked very different that there was more credit stress starting to build, concern about land values and some other items there. As we've gone through the pandemic and as we're now looking at conditions in 2023, we're seeing things quite differently. Um, there's been a pretty dramatic increase in working capital built up on balance sheets in the farm sector. Um, delinquency rates as we measure various conditions associated with financial stress are very, very low. As we talk to contacts, lenders and otherwise, very few lenders will describe that there are significant problems associated with loan repayments. In fact, those have been very, very high the past two years. Many producers are in a very strong financial position. They've continued to be in a position to acquire land. They've been able to be in a position to consider expansion of their operations. So we're seeing dramatically different financial conditions these past two years, supporting how we would see the outlook for 2023. Now, there will be risks, and I'll, I'll get to some of those in a few minutes, but as we assess conditions that Carrie alluded to with respect to farm income, we're seeing credit conditions ex still extremely strong. I wanna talk just for a minute about land values because Carrie mentioned the size of the, the farm balance sheet and assets, and many people who follow agriculture will know that land accounts for by far the largest portion of what constitutes assets on the farm balance sheet. And there's two reasons that we think that farmland values are especially important for tracking conditions in agriculture. One is simply that, the fact that land accounts for a very large percentage of assets. But the other is because as it relates to financial institutions, many farmers will use land as collateral for operating loans. So to the extent that the land market is extremely strong, that supports credit conditions in agriculture because farmers have more resources to then pursue things that they would need for, require, for requirements and operations, such as, as operating expenses. When we look at the land market, again, we went through a period from 2010 to 2013 in agriculture that was perhaps one of the best that we had seen in a long time, and many farmers would have said that maybe this was the best that they were ever going to experience in their lifetime. And then we went into a down cycle from about 2014 through 2019, where again, as I mentioned earlier, commodity prices were, were low for quite some time. Um, land values had been declining during that time. We've gone from that environment and in 2021 in the region that we cover at the Kansas City Fed, and I would suggest that this is true as you look at other parts of the Midwest and, and other areas concentrated in agriculture, that we actually saw increases in land values of about 25% in 2021 from the previous year. And these were already at quite elevated levels. Going into 2022, we saw obviously lots of volatility in commodity markets, the war in Ukraine, many things that disrupted how we might've thought about conditions in agriculture. But yet by the end of 2022, we were still seeing further gains of about 10% in our region as it relates to land values. So in terms of the equity, in terms of the asset values that farmers have at their disposal to be able to support financial conditions going forward, again, they've been in a very strong position. Likewise, cash rents. And so we think about, again, many farmers don't necessarily have the resources of land that they own, but they're perhaps paying rents um, you know, we've continued to see some increases there as well. So for landowners, that may be a good thing in terms of what they're able to command in terms of higher rents. For those that see that as a cost, that's, that's potentially a, a higher risk. And so I'll use that to segue just into the last couple of minutes of what I wanna share here this morning as it relates to the risks that we're monitoring and how we think about conditions going forward. If, if you walk away with nothing this morning, what I would suggest is that as we see the environment for agricultural finance and credit looking ahead in 2023, it looks remarkably stable, despite what Carrie alluded to as the potential for some declines in farm income. But there are risks as we look further ahead, and I think these are the risks that I would suggest that we keep track of going forward. The first is production costs, and, and Carrie mentioned some of these that were exceptionally high 
in 2021 and 2022. We have seen some moderation in some of those, but those are some things that many of our contacts will point to as perhaps the most dominant risk looking ahead, which is just managing those costs, the uncertainty of those costs, coming out of an environment with substantial supply disruptions and so forth. So that would be the first. The second and related to that would be drought. Um, there's parts of the country that have not dealt with drought for quite some time. I come from a part of the country that has dealt with significant drought. And so for some producers, the costs that I mentioned a minute ago will be even more exacerbated by the fact that, that they're more pronounced as you move further west. This is especially true for livestock operations and cattle operations where feed costs are a primary component of what goes into those costs. So the second risk that I would highlight that I think we want to be cognizant of in assessing conditions going forward is drought. The third, and again, related to the first two, is profit margins. So most of what producers and their lenders care about ultimately comes back to profit margins and their ability to repay loans. Profit margins are likely to be thinner as we look forward. Um, we've seen substantial increases the last couple of years supported by dramatic increases in commodity prices, costs that initially did not rise, but what we've seen in the past is that commodity prices tend to, pull, to, tend to pull back faster than we ultimately see as it relates to, to costs. So that's something to watch for. The fourth risk that I'll mention, and Kerry uh, introduced this nicely, is as it relates to debt. We are seeing some increases in debt. Uh, this was not the case in 2021 and the first part of 2022. Typically in the farm sector, what we see when incomes are very high is that we see, we see producers taking a stance of trying to pay down debt. They tend to be conservative when it comes to those sorts of things. Uh, and when incomes are very high, we tend to not see a lot of demand for loans. Over the past year and a half or the year, a year or so, we've seen a turn where as, as profit margins have become thinner, as costs have been higher, we've seen more demand for financing. And so that's going to be something to pay attention to, again, not necessarily immediately, but the problems that we've seen in the past that can accumulate with debt are notable. And so that's something that I think we'll wanna watch. The fifth one is as it relates to incomes, and I think we need to pay attention to is government payments. Um, Carrie mentioned again, the strength of incomes, and we've seen this play out in credit conditions the past two years, but many of the lenders that we would talk to from 2018 through 2020 would have told us that a significant portion of those incomes ultimately came from government payments. There likely were borrowers who would not have been in a, in a position to continue to operate had it not been for the payments that we saw, not just through the, the pandemic, but the MFP payments that happened the two years prior. So government payments, again, being a risk. Um, the next one that I'll point to, and I've just got a couple more and I'll wrap up my comments, is these, and the last few are more macro concerned. Um, and we pay a lot of attention to this at the Fed as it relates to, to macroeconomic conditions because of the tie to interest rates. And, and the next one that I'll point to is economic growth. Um, agriculture, like every other industry, is going to be dependent on broader economic conditions that we see, not just in the U.S., but globally. 21 was a, 2021 was a banner year in terms of economic growth with a recovery from the pandemic, supported by stimulus payments, and ultimately a turn in economic conditions. Um, the growth that we saw in 2021 was probably not going to be sustainable, and we saw that pull back in 2022. And then forecasts for 2023 are actually very modest and, and growth prospects for 2024 also quite modest. So the strength of global demand for products, agriculture being included in that, will be dependent on what we see as the path for economic growth. The next risk that I'll point to is exchange rates. Um, we've seen a stronger dollar over the past year and the dollar is determined by a multitude of factors. Agriculture is, of course, an industry that depends on exports, and so we're going to need to pay attention to what happens to the strength of export activity, uh, ultimately in support of commodity, commodity prices and profits. The last risk that I'll point to, and I'll end here, is with respect to interest rates. Kerry mentioned that we are expecting to see a pickup in interest rates uh, in terms of the expenses of, of what that means for producers. We have already seen increases in interest rates that are feeding into the adjustments that producers will have to make. I will qualify this by saying that interest expenses tend to not be the dominant factor of how producers go about making decisions, but yet there will be an adjustment this year as producers are considering the decisions that they make uh, going forward. So just to wrap up my comments, and I'll look forward to the discussion, um, my assessment of conditions this year is that credit conditions in ag look really pretty strong, um, but I do think that there are some significant risks to be cognizant of. I think that it's possible that we still see a heightened envi environment of volatility and uncertainty this year. Um, and so I look forward to the discussion and, and other questions. Well, thank you, Nate. Um, 
Our, la our third and uh, final formal presenter of this session is Pat Westhoff. Pat, take it away. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. So uh, Terry and, and uh, Nate have already covered a lot of the big picture questions. I'm going to try to avoid just repeating what others have said. Uh, let's see if I can get my presentation popping up here. Here we go. <clears throat> So we're talking about the status of the farm economy, some issues relevant to the farm bill debate, and a few of the uncertainties that face the sector. So as Kerry said, we're looking at uh, record levels of net farm income in nominal terms in uh, 2022, with a drop off expected in 2023. The projections shown here are ones we prepared back in December. We are doing a revised set of estimates right now, and I don't expect major changes from this picture I'm gonna talk about in the slides to come. So part of the reason for the lower projections for farm income going forward, of course, are drops in commodity prices, as, as both Kerry and Nate have alluded to already. Uh, if you look at the left-hand chart for the case of corn, USDA and Papri, both in our projections prepared back in November, and current futures markets as of last week, looking at the December contracts for corn on the left chart and the November contracts for soybeans on the right chart, all suggest that we're looking at lower prices uh, for crops harvest in 2023, 24, and 25 relative to the crops harvest of this past year. In the case of soybeans, uh, the current market is a little bit higher than we would have anticipated back in November, largely because the South American crop, especially in Argentina, appears to be coming in smaller than earlier anticipated. So why have prices been as high as they've been over the last year? Of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a major factor in, in agricultural markets across the world. One of the reasons why grain prices have been as strong as they were in 2022. Weather, of course, is always very important in agriculture. In South America, we had a reduced crop of soybeans last year in Brazil, this year in Argentina. So that's had the effect of supporting prices for, for not just soybeans, but for other uh, crops in the grain and oilseed sectors. In this country, we had reduced production of wheat, cotton, and corn this past year because of less than, per, you know, less than perfect conditions in growing areas uh, for those commodities. And cattle inventories are less than they always would have been had it not been for a long-term drought in many of the western states that has reduced forage availability and cattle numbers. As we look forward, that's going to have an impact on beef production in 2023 and beyond, helping to support beef prices, even as some other feed costs and may be coming down in the near future. A very partial list of other issues, avian influenza had a huge impact on the egg sector in particular this past year, also turkeys and broilers to some extent. Uh, if we are able to get past that uh, issue in 2023, that will be increased supplies and lower prices for those commodities. We've had a relatively strong U.S. and global economy, and of course, where we go going forward will depend on how that economy evolves. Gary and Ada already alluded to higher production expenses and all the reasons why that has occurred. And another uh, policy-related issue is that we've had a big expansion of production of renewable diesel in this country because of uh, policy measures federally and in California. Here's some, uh, some big picture view on the crop receipt side. So if, you know, you've heard uh, Kerry tell the story of how we got to 2022 and 2023. These are projections we would have prepared last uh, fall, uh, looking forward over the next 10 years. Note that yellow is corn, blue is soybeans. That corn and soybeans combined account for more than half of total U.S. crop uh, receipts in 2022. Pretty remarkable. Just two commodities account for more than half of the total value of sales of agricultural crops in this country. Going forward with those lower prices we project, you know, those come down a little bit. Uh, and you can see the overall changes that we, we come off of the peak of 2022, we remain above the levels that we saw uh, during the 2015 to 2019 period in particular. On the livestock side, a relatively similar story. We don't see a drop in cattle for the reasons we just talked about, but on the broiler, chicken, and especially the egg side, a big drop off of receipts expected in 2023. So lower level results of receipts on the poultry side, bringing down overall uh, livestock sector receipts off of the 2022 peak, but still well above the levels of 2015 through 2021. 20, uh, Expenses have increased dramatically. Uh, we saw a sharp run up in 2022, a modest increase expected in 2023 because of offsetting impacts, as has been discussed already. I uh, broke out uh, fuel and fertilizer on the bottom there, big run ups in fuel and fertilizer costs last year, fertilizer prices spiking for a large number of reasons, including the war in Ukraine uh, that reduced the uh, supplies of natural gas to Western Europe, drove up natural gas prices there, making it more expensive to produce uh, fertilizer in Europe and having an effect on global markets because of that. Uh, feed costs, of course, are up sharply because of higher uh, prices for corn and other feeds. Uh, those expected to come down as we look forward. Uh, interest costs, you know, relatively small share of total expenses, but of course increasing with higher interest rates now, and of course all the other expenses that the ag sector faces. 
If you think about particular crops, now again, focusing on corn and soybeans, uh, with the higher prices and uh, the yields we experienced the last couple of years, we had record levels of per acre receipts for selling corn and for soybeans in, from the 2022 crop it currently appears. Uh, as those prices come down, those receipts will fall off if, if that's indeed what happens. Expenses we expect to be roughly as high for the 2023 crop as they were for a lot of the 2022 crop. Uh, but then as fertilizer and fuel prices come down a little bit, we expect to see those uh, variable costs of, of production uh, fall off a bit. Note that those variable expenses do not include land, do not include machinery purchase or other overhead expenses. So that's not a measure of profits, it's a measure of returns over uh, variable expenses only. Uh, for wheat and cotton, relatively similar stories. Uh, again, peak levels of receipts in, in 2022 because of very high prices in spite of reduced yields. So prices went up more than yields went down in the case of wheat. Uh, but going forward, lower prices re result in lower margins uh, going forward for wheat than we saw in the peak year of 2022. And cotton, again, high production expenses. I uh, mean, those margins are, are tighter than they are as a proportion of the value of the crop than they are for some other commodities. To give maybe a longer uh, view of history, this goes back to 1986 now, and it's, it's focused on federal spending rather than actual just payments to farmers uh, for various programs. The blue part of the bar will be the basic commodity programs that are covered in farm bills historically. Uh, the green is going to be, uh, the next part of the bar is going to be crop insurance. Um, you know, so that's, of course, a very major, major share of the overall uh, expenditure picture these days, uh, followed by conservation programs in green. And if you look at the period between about 20, 1998 and 2019, that some of those averaged about $20 billion per year. But between 2020 and 2022, uh, you know, we saw a sharp spike up, not because of the basic farm bill commodity programs or because of crop insurance, but because of additional programs that were either passed by Congress or that were uh, done by the administration under their authorities under the Commodity Credit uh, Corporation Charter Act. So that average for the last four years was about $40 billion, $42 billion. Uh, again, if there's no new laws passed, if, if the administration does not take new initiatives, that number will come back down again in fiscal 23 and, and beyond if there's nothing uh, new that uh, is, is taken up. Uh, CPO's baseline came out very recently, and as you look at that's a very major part of the farm bill debate going forward. Uh, so the, the first column there is going to give you the estimates for the current fiscal year, fiscal year 2023. And the expenditure on the basic uh, farm commodity programs are very, very small this year. The agricultural risk coverage program and the price loss coverage program, uh, both created by the 2014 farm bill and extended the 2018 farm bill, will cost next to nothing as, as prices for the major commodities are well above the levels that result in payments under those programs. Crop insurance, you know, they had a very expensive program, but the most expensive every year for crop insurance if CBO's estimates are, are borne out. Over $15 billion expected expenditures to taxpayers uh, from that program during the current fiscal year. Again, a number of problems in producing cotton and a variety of other crops this past year, resulting in large indemnity payments uh, for crop insurance and, and returns to, uh, to, the, uh, to producers because of that. Conservation programs, about $5 billion in fiscal year 23. And the SNAP program, $127 billion uh, in fiscal year 23, down from the record level of fiscal year 2022. Total of those programs, $149 billion. There's other some small, small programs that are also including the crop and the um, farm bill are not including that, those estimates. For the next 10 years, 2024 to 2023, you can see the relevant numbers for those commodities. It's some of those 10 years. So that means that the commodity programs average about $6 billion per year, crop insurance about $10 billion per year, the conservation program is about $7 billion per year, and the SNAP program about $120 billion per year. So over $1.4 trillion of expected spending by CBO's estimate on these basic uh, farm bill uh, programs uh, going forward. Uh, just to dig in kind of the weeds here really briefly to, to show how these projections matter a lot in the farm bill debate. Uh, the left-hand chart is giving CBO's estimates of projected corn prices in green and what's called the effective reference price. That's the, the price that, or a, a policy-driven price that is used to determine whether or not payments will be made under the price loss coverage program. Under the 2018 Farm Bill, there's an escalator clause uh, that allows the effective reference price to increase when a moving average of market prices is sufficiently high. And that trigger actually is, is met in 2024, and, and you can see that because of that, there's a couple years where the blue line's above the green line. So, I mean, even at average prices projected by CBO, there would actually be payments on the price loss coverage program again for the first time in a couple of years. Uh, then going beyond that, of course, because it's based on moving averages, 
Uh, the, the reference price drops below uh, the projected market prices. Again, no payments would occur if you had average prices. CBO, as we do, will look at distribution of possible outcomes to come up with our estimates, but that, that program and other programs will cost in the future. In the case of soybeans, you see that the, the lines never cross, but they become much more narrow, so expected expenditures become possible if we ever were to have prices a bit below uh, the CBO projected levels. Crop insurance, if you look over the last uh, 11 years, uh, between 2011 and 2021, I should say, uh, the overall spending on that program was about $5.2 billion per year in terms of payments to producers for indemnities for losses in excess of what the producers themselves paid in premiums. Uh, there's other costs of the program, and that's the, the return to, to producers, if you will, uh, from the program of $5.2 billion per year over that 11-year period. You know that every single year, the net benefits to producers uh, were positive. They, were, they paid more, paid less, I should say, in premiums out of their pocket than they received back in MD payments when you look at farmers as a group. Uh, looking forward, uh, premium subsidies have jumped uh, dramatically the last couple of years uh, with higher commodity prices. The value of crops insured has increased a lot. And because of the, uh, uh, some expansion of the program to include some rangeland, for example, more acres have been covered as well. Uh, we expect that the overall value of, of receipts, of re, re, premiums, I should say, and premium subsidies will fall back a little bit, remain well above the, the 2020, uh, pre-2020 levels. We have lower prices. Our estimates are a bit above uh, CPO's estimates for February. We do expect to see a bit of a drop off. We do our new projections in March, but we'll probably still be above CPO's. So that has implications, of course, as we think about the farm bill debate going forward. I'll just list a few of the uncertainties. Uh, Nate's already covered a lot of these. You know, weather, weather, weather. I mean, it's, it's always going to be a surprise of what's going to actually happen versus what we might have expected to happen in normal weather conditions. Uh, we'll take off all these that have happened in the last few years, but you can expect there will always be surprises going forward on the weather that are going to affect markets in a major way. You know, if I was trying to talk to you, uh, uh, what, uh, 12 months and a few weeks ago, I would not have been anticipating the war in Ukraine. I mean, it would have happened because of that. So depending on future conditions in Ukraine, and then the other geopolitical issues that may arise, those could have a big effect on agricultural markets. General economy always matters. If we were to have a, a larger recession, that could be negative for demand for agricultural products and much more. Biofuel policy has been shown to matter a lot and will continue to be a very important uh, consideration going forward. Uh, what happens in China, what happens in other major trading countries, of course, is also very critical. Longer term, things like electric vehicles could be very important for the future of demand for biofuels and for liquid fuels in general. There could be consumer to food demand shifts that can affect the agricultural sector's uh, uh, ability to sell its products. And of course, climate change is always a concern as we try to think about the longer term. And oh yeah, this is a thing called the Farm Bill. Right, so thanks a lot for the opportunity and look forward to, to uh, hearing the rest of the discussion. Well, for the discussion, we're going to turn first to Dr. Offit. Susan, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you all for your presentations. I was able to read about it before I heard you talk. Very well done. Thank you. Um, and what we've heard these uh, three experts tell us about is the situation viewing the farm sector in the aggregate. We know, however, that there's a lot of heterogeneity within the farm sector. That will be the subject of our next panel. But it's particularly relevant when we think about the role of government payments and their contribution to the well-being of the farm sector, farm households, and uh, the financial condition as well. And here, it's established that most of the payments, setting conservation aside, go to a very small portion of farmers, and that these farmers are indeed quite wealthy. If you can, there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice this, uh, but if you look at commercial farmers, um, which uh, the ERS definition, um, there, these are farm households whose annual income is something on the order of $300,000 a year, and their net worth is $5 million. This is where the bulk of our payments go. So you might ask yourself um, to focus more strongly on the well-being of this group, because that's who gets payments. Um, neither Pat nor um, Nate actually disaggregate their forecasts to look at different kinds of farmers. Uh, in the ERS um, reports behind what Carrie talked about, there are. But this fact that uh, a minority in the commercial farms I just mentioned are about 9% of all farmers. Now, I would also point out we have a really archaic definition of what a farm is. And we might argue that commercial farmers are, in fact, the ag sector. And 
that might not be a bad idea to redefine it someday. Um, but when you look at not only the well-being of those farm households in the commercial farm sector, um, but their financial position, you have to conclude that the motivation for farm payments has nothing to do with economics. It's politics. It's rent seeking. It's what I think Rick, I mean, Vince has talked about as crony capitalism. These are transfer payments that have gone on for years. The Environmental Working Group just told us that there's a group of not in, of in uh, considerable size who have received subsidy payments for 37 years straight. So at this point, you have to say to yourself, is this really sensitivity to variation in economic conditions or is something else going on here? We can talk about the political economy of farm payments, and I think we should. Um, because the question of need, of equity, has to be part of a political discussion. And while economics has its place, I, I believe that as an economist, we have to recognize in farm policy it has a small place. Um, but the second question is, well, um, even if economics isn't necessarily the motivation for farm payments, what are the effects of these payments on this sector, on commercial farms? Um, what do, in, in, in essence, say, what do we get for $10 billion a year, which is, I think, what we're talking about in 2023, which is, I used to work at the Office of Management and Budget. That is real money, $10 billion a year. What do we get? Well, for example, Nate mentioned the, um, uh, actually, I'll touch on the question, the increase in land values. Well, where, what drives increases in land values? Certainly strong commodity prices, but we also know that one of the main in, the main drivers or a driver of increases in land values is the capitalization of subsidies into land values. That's important. How important? Um, what are the micro level farm, the farm level effects of receiving these payments? How does it affect risk management? How does it affect land acquisition? How does it affect succession? We don't know. I'll just mention that as part of my preparation for this, I went back through 10 years, every single issue of the American Journal of Agricultural Economics, which is the flagship journal for the discipline of agricultural economics. You can count on the number of one hand, one hand the, uh, the number of articles that dealt with the micro level effects, the farm level effects of subsidy payments. There is discussion of crop insurance, but mostly in a, a fairly technical way that affects the way crop insurance works. So what we have is a group of economists who were created, who came into existence to study the economics of agriculture, completely having stepped away. Why is that? I think we should talk about it. One, I admit, I think is the uh, lack of data. These very large farms, particularly the very large farms, um, are not well represented either in federal surveys. The response rate for the main USDA farm survey for these very large farms is was below 50% several years ago, it may be lower now, farm record systems in land-grant universities that used to take in data from a, the farms in the state, they've withered as well. And it's largely because very large, complicated operations, when you come to them with the survey, it's very difficult. It's a lot of time. We don't know. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why we don't know about these large operations. But yet $10 billion a year goes to I don't know what's the best number to use, 9% of farms. So uh, I would just say that uh, the topics for discussion today ought to be um, what is the distribution of farm payments? Why don't more people recognize how concentrated it is? Two, what are the political determinants of farm payments? This is obviously in play. We're coming to a farm bill. And the third one is how do we find out what we get for $10 billion a year? Um, there's very little discussion of that. What effect does it actually have on the farm sector and on decisions? So there's plenty to go on, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the morning. Well, thank you, Susan. As a quick uh, preview, um, the issue of who's getting what out of the farm bill will be at least partially addressed in a couple of the presentations to come, uh, and it's the usual suspects. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to invite Josh Sewell to provide some insights as well. Yeah, that's uh, quite a bit to follow. Um, we'll see if I have a few insights here. But <clears throat> I think one thing I want to bring up, uh, I want to reiterate that you know, for me, the question is, where's the crisis? And I think these numbers show that uh, they're reminiscent of, the, of this debate we had in the last Farm Bill. Uh, you'll see the members of the Ag Committee pointing to the fact that farm income was dropping 
compared to 2013. You know, again, which until last year was, at the time, record highs. So I want to caution new ag members, uh, new members of Congress and staffers themselves who are engaged in this to, to, put this in, to put this in perspective. Is there an actual farm crisis? And I think it's pretty clearly the data says no. That being said, uh, it is fair to look at the experience of the pandemic and the experience across the country and see, are there holes in the safety net? And I think that's a legitimate question to have. Uh, and you don't get the answer from the aggregate data, right? Because there is such a diversity within agriculture. Um, but that's where we should be having the debate is where, if anywhere, have there been holes in the safety net where people have not, people and corporations have not been able to weather events that are outside of their control, where have they fallen through, this, through, through the holes if they exist? Um, that's not going to be the debate we have if we're only fighting about baseline. You know, if the ag committees want to come out and say, we have to defend a certain level of payments, no matter what, we're not going to have a debate about the economic implications and the social policy implications of having uh, these various bills, these various policies that are governed by the Farm Bill. So I think that's a really important thing for people to remember. You know, a second thing, we talked a little bit about the CBO baseline that came out, the Congressional, Bu Congressional Budget Office. There is a lot of really important information that they came out with just recently, mostly about the overall economy and the, 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 the position that our um, federal deficit and our debts are within that. And so when, we, when policymakers are out here thinking about what to do, if there are these holes in the safety net, what can we do for these effects of, of government payments, you've got to put in perspective the fact that we're also seeing record levels of debt. We are reaching a level of a macroeconomic experiment that we've never done in this country. We are exceeding the size of our economy very soon in our accumulated federal debt. Trillion dollar annual, trillion dollar annual deficits are a thing of, of permanence now. And it's actually going to be averaging $2 trillion a year over the next 10 years. So this is a level of peacetime debt that is unprecedented, and we don't know the implications of that. So that's why we are cautioning that if we move forward into the Farm Bill, it's not about protecting baseline. It's not just about saving money. It's about figuring out what we have to spend on, how we can spend on that uh, in a way that is going to be sustainable for the future. So those are the two big things that really came out of this when I look at this. And also, uh, we really like to just summarize this for folks who are trying to figure out what to do in this context is you gotta follow the three Fs of farm policy. Keep it focused, both on, both on important public policy issues but also within these programs on the people and the institutions that actually need assistance. So what are we protecting people from? And who are we protecting from? That's really important. You have to be fiscally responsible because again, deficits and debt do matter. And they're gonna matter more in the future. They matter politically, certainly right now, certainly in the farm bill debate, but I think they matter economically as well. And finally, we need to foster resilience instead of dependence. One of the things, when you look at this data also, government payments have been very uh, helpful for some folks, and I think there's some truth to that. There are some businesses that may not be uh, in existence now without the, the government support. Truth is, there are some businesses that probably shouldn't be in existence, but are because of that support. What we need to make sure in the future is that, that the types of assistance that we have in the safety net is actually fostering resilience instead of dependence. We can't mute the market signal so much that businesses don't have to actually don't even get to respond to market realities. And I think that's a real important thing to move moving forward in thinking of both the financial safety net and the response to climate change uh, and conservation writ large. You know, there's a lot of assistance that we can do, and I think from a public policy perspective, it's important to do. But we need to make sure that we're making room for innovation and opportunity uh, and not actually making it so that the, the sector doesn't even have the opportunity to adjust uh, to market realities. And so that's the three Fs of foreign policy, we like to call that. And if you do those right, then you can, about, you can avoid the fourth one, which is something we're not allowed to say on, on C-SPAN. So those are, the, those are the main things that I get from this. And perhaps as the, as the least credentialed person up here, I think that's kind of a, a different perspective here is that the politics are very important in this, but it's also important that we need to do what's right. And we can't afford to do what's right and respond to the crises that we know are going to be, no one predicted, People don't actually predict recessions, right? No one predicted, no one in power predicted COVID-19. No one in power predicted uh, the 2018 uh, recession and the bailout that occurred. But we know those are going to happen again. So we have to have the flexibility to respond in ways that we need to respond. Uh, and we're not going to be able to do that if we don't make, which shouldn't be that hard of decisions uh, in our safety nets right now. Well, thank you, Josh. 
Um, and thank you, Pal, for being efficient with your time. I appreciate it. As moderator, you made my life easy. Nate, I want to come back to something you said about farm bankruptcies. And I want to provide a little bit of context. My understanding is that under Chapter 12, which is the preferred route for farms to take bankruptcies, Throughout the period 2010 to 2020, fewer than 550 farms each year declared bankruptcy under that statute out of USDA's total of 2.1 million or approximately, I'm looking at Kerry to make sure I'm not lying here. And if we say it's the top 9%, uh, about 175,000 uh, to 180,000. There's no other sector, is there, that comes close to that small amount of bankruptcy for companies, whether it's the tech companies, whether it's uh, automobiles and the supply systems that support them and so on. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, how many farms are under, quote, severe financial stress, as defined by USDA, which rate has ranged over the last 15 years from about 2% to maybe a little bit above 3% in total. In that context, should we really care if, say, there's a 20% increase in farm bankruptcies? So I guess a little bit of, of a caveat first when we talk about farm bankruptcies. The, the Chapter 12 farm bankruptcies that, that you're referring to have size limitations. Sure. So those are typically best thought of as rather small farm operations. So it's true that we were seeing modest increases in farm bankruptcies during that time from 2014 through 2019. Many of those were small dairies located in Wisconsin. Um, the larger farm, farm operations would not qualify for Chapter 12. So just a, a limitation sure. of, of the data there in terms of what we see. Um, I do think that it's important to track what we see with respect to broader financial conditions there. Um, and again, the, the Chapter 12 bankruptcy data is one way that we go about trying to assess that. But there are broader measures that, that we would look at, that ERS would look at, and others to try to get a sense of what that aggregate financial stress is. Because I do think that it's important to again, make sure that we're following it from a number of angles and not just limiting it to one segment that in the case of the chapter 12 would be more specific to, to, farm, to small farms. Uh, Kerry, was I roughly correct about the uh, financial stress data? Or, or is, am I asking you to go beyond your brief there? No, um, yeah, you, you're right. There's about 2 million farms in the US. We have, a, as Nate mentioned, a collection of different data that you could use to measure financial stress. I think you'll get to see some of them in the next panel as sure. well, like operating profit margin. Um, but we have a, like 18 different financial ratios that we can look at. Yeah. Um, Pat, what do you see in the future in terms of likely increase or diminishing, uh, diminishment of financial stress, given, your, given the numbers that you've shared with us? Sure. Our colleague, <coughs> colleagues at uh, Texas A&M University have a representative farm program they've been running for a number of years now. So they talk to groups of farmers around the country, build panel farms that represent agriculture in those areas. Uh, the, the share of those farms that are experiencing stress now is less than it was during the 2015 to 2019 period, clearly. Uh, but there are some concerns going forward as the commodity prices are expected to come down. Uh, we don't have their final numbers yet from, the, from our 2023 baseline yet. But I expect to see at least you know, some parts of the country that are expected to see some stress uh, given relatively tight returns. Josh and, and Susan, what do you all think about these fundamental data? I think you've already shared it, but just to reflect back on that. Well, I think um, Josh's point about the way we frame, the, I think in the, in the lay press, the way we frame the question of how is the farm sector doing comes down to two things. What's happening to farm income and our production costs going up? So as soon as people hear income's going down and costs are going up, every, everyone's hair goes on fire, right? Oh my gosh, this is the motivation. But obviously it's a much more complicated picture. And I think this disaggregation given this quote, two million farms that we have is critical and we'll hear about it in, in the next panel. The, at this point, the question of how many farms are under stress or not stress is going to be a small number, no matter what. Um, the farms that produce most of what we eat and export 
are very well organized businesses. They're competent. They know how to access the credit sector. You know, I think we can trust them to look out for their own interests. The people who are not in that part of the ag sector, that may require different measures. And I, I think that that's worth discussing. Secretary Vilsack has recently started to talk about, and others, as have other secretaries of agriculture, about what you do about the, the farms that aren't the commercial ones, the large and the very large farms in the ERS uh, world. And uh, that's important to distinguish uh, in, in the Farm Bill. But it's much more convenient politically to paint with a broad brush and to allow people to assume that the two million farms, two million people that we call farmers in this country uh, are all experiencing the same level of stress or the same level of prosperity. Um, just as a quick comment, uh, as, as the moderator, all three of our presenters made the point that while farm, uh, farm receipts are going to diminish somewhat, and farm expenses have gone up. Nevertheless, uh, 2023 net cash income, which my view is that's a more meaningful number than, uh, than the, uh, the other number, um, is still going to be in at least the top 10 over the last 50 years. Uh, it's exceptionally high, and, and farms are actually really doing exceptionally well from a historical pro uh, context. We're not in... 2002, for example, when corn prices were inflation adjusted at record lows. Um, so I think that, that set of insights is really interesting and I really appreciate the fact that all three of you said the same thing. Um, questions from the audience? Yes. Um, Bob Thompson, Professor Emeritus, University of Illinois. Um, it seems that with coming into a period of higher interest rates, we ought to start factoring in a higher discount rate when we discount the expected flow of future net revenues and figuring out what we can afford to pay for farm land. Uh, if you divide the cash flow by 0.1, uh, you're going to get a very large number, but uh, is that really, re are current land prices really realistic, or can we possibly avoid this bubble bursting and uh, having a downward adjustment as we uh, become uh, accustomed to both uh, perhaps a bit lower cash flow and a higher, uh, and a higher discount rate? So if interest rates go up, do land prices go down? I can, I can take a stab at that, and others feel free to chime in. Um, you know, generally speaking, you would expect to see that an increase in interest rates would put downward pressure on land values. And I say generally, um, largely because there are many other factors that also go into that. Uh, we've been in a highly unusual environment the past few years, and what I will say is when there tends to be instability and uncertainty about um, cash prospects in any different sector or investment prospects, going forward, there tends to be a premium that's paid for assets that generate stable returns over a very long time horizon. And agriculture and farm real estate has fit that, that category. And so I think that you've seen a number of other reasons that whether it's farmers or investors expressing interest in farmland, inflation could be one of those as a hedge against that. So there are a number of things that go into, I think, the determination ultimately of how land is valued. Um, but in short, yes, you would expect that in, an, in normal circumstances, higher interest rates would put some downward pressure on those land prices going forward. Which leads to a follow-up question, I suspect, which is, uh, what it, isn't it paradoxical then, in some ways, that prices for land in the region served by the Kansas City Fed and also by the Minneapolis Fed uh, pr land prices have jumped 9 to 10% in the region that your bank serves and 18 to 20% apparently in the region served by the Minneapolis Fed. So that's really the Great Plains. Yeah, and I think a primary reason for that was uh, described well by Pat here a minute ago in showing that much of the, um, the, the cash receipts were tied to corn and soybeans. So those, those areas of the country that were predominantly concentrated in corn and soybeans because of the profit increases in those industries really were quite substantial. 
Um, and, and as was alluded to earlier, there certainly are distributional differences when it comes to income, not just on the basis of the size of farm operations, but regions as well. And so when we look at, the, at, at disparities regionally across the country, you're certainly going to see some of that that's tied to the kind of industry or the region that they're located in. Let's, ask, uh, let's turn to another question. Oh, so, I'm sorry, Susan. Well, before we leave this question of land values, you know, uh, uh, Nate mentioned investors, um, and there's been play lately in the press about who is buying farmland, right? This harkens back to the day when we were worried about the Prince of Liechtenstein buying too much farmland. But who is it these days? People like Bill Gates. Well, why do these people buy farmland? Well, it's a good hedge against inflation, but how much of that is because people, savvy investors know that the government has a role, will step up in keeping land values from crashing, right? So again, the, the issue is, uh, it's a distributional issue. Who, value, who benefits from higher land values? People with a lot of land. Well, the more there are non-farm, uh, non, non-farmers owning land, that's a distribution away from, as Josh would point out, the goals of farm policy. So again, the question, and this is, you know, I spent seven years at GAO and it finally had an impact on me. Um, what, what, where are we going with this? What do we get and who gets it and why? And uh, those are questions that we're going to come to in the second panel. Yes, sir. Bert Ely, a banking consultant and a longtime observer of the fire and credit system. Uh, my question is kind of following up on, on the previous question. If financial stress hits uh, the ag sector for whatever reason, and if it in particular has a, a negative impact on farmland values, where will that stress exp- extend to past farmers and into financial institutions? Uh, as we know, in the 80s, uh, uh, a lot of uh, smaller farm banks uh, uh, f- uh, failed. Uh, the farm credit system uh, had its issues. Uh, what are, to what extent would uh, a similar circumstance uh, arise if we get a significant downturn uh, in uh, farmland prices? What financial institutions are going to really feel the effect of that, and how serious might that impact be? Who would like to take that question on? As a moderator, I'd love to, but it's not my role. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can take it again, but others feel free to, to, to chime in here, too. Um, you know, I, I do think that, that Susan made a very important point here earlier in, in recognizing that regardless of whether we're talking about government payments or some other aspect of uh, finance and income, those, those supports do tend to find their way into the capitalization of certain assets. And so land could be one of those markets. It would be important then to try to make sure that we understand any potential change to policy in terms of how that might affect things like land or other asset markets in some ways that might not be foreseen or in some ways that that lead to some unintended outcomes. Um, When we saw the issues of the 1980s, part of the reason that there was such a a financial crisis in ag associated with land was in part because of leverage that had built up in the financial sector that was ultimately tied to land as a collateral on those loans. And so as you saw land values diminish at a time of higher interest rates, it caused severe financial pressure. I do think there have been some mitigants over the past 10 years associated with that outcome, um, in part because during the, the low interest rate environment, you saw many financial institutions, both the farm credit system and banks, take a fairly conservative approach when it came to lending. Uh, They were not necessarily lending on the entire value of the land. They would have have put ceilings in place in terms of loan-to-value ratios to try to protect against the scenario that you're describing of a potential decline in land values. So I think that that provides some mitigation, but I do think that if if you're talking, depending on what kind of magnitude increase you're talking about as, as a possible decline in land values, that of course would ripple through uh, the, the farm financial sector in part because of the size of, of land in terms of the, the contribution to balance sheets. Yes. Uh, and maybe just following up on Dr. Thompson's question, in our own projections, you know, we are showing relatively flat values of land going forward as these various things are offsetting one another. The fact that we do have higher interest rates, the fact that we do have a, a bit of a decline in, in net returns relative to what it has been the last two or three years. Uh, you know, stops those, those markets from expanding as fast as they have been. It does mean that there is a potential for stress if prices fall sharper on the output side or if interest rates go higher uh, than we currently anticipate. And I think back to the 1980s, of course, too, a lot of the institutions that got in trouble were very, very focused on agricultural loans. 
and you probably have a smaller share of the, of the lending institutions today that are quite as focused on agricultural loans as would have been the case back then. So in a related discussion, though, um, Carrie, just to follow up again, uh, Nate, you and Nate talked about an increase in debt within the farm sector. Now, the impact on debt to asset ratios has been really almost minimal. Uh, what did you go from about 13.09% debt to asset ratio to about 13.12, something like that. Um, which, by the way, in a broader context means that farming has incredibly low debt to asset ratios. Uh, and and in, the, in the farm crisis of the 1980s, you were looking at debt to asset ratios in the range of 27, 26%, which is a different world. Um, of that debt, how much is due to the increase in debt associated with land and buildings in mortgage debt, rather than in farmers saying, I need money for seed or, or fuel? Yeah, I'm trying to visualize it in my head. Um, I believe, oh, sorry. <laughs> I believe that most of the forecasted growth in debt is in non-real estate debt. I think we've that's where the action has been in the past few years. So is that being driven by concerns about higher input prices, Pat? It's part of the story. And of course, when you think about a, a sector-wide debt to asset ratio, you have to be careful because a lot of farmers don't have any debt at all. You know, so there's a, a smaller share of, pr of producers that have a lot higher levels of debt. It would be more vulnerable to economic downturns. Please. Excuse me, this is Philip Rasher with AgriPulse. This is probably a question for Pat and Nate, but it seems like one of the big factors that's changed over the last few years that we've seen is this. Pat, you, you mentioned the growth in renewable diesel. I'm curious as to how much of a factor you see con considering all of the plans for increased capacity, both on the production and the, uh, the soybean crushing side, how much you see that underpinning the, the farm economy over the next 10 years in creating competition for soybeans and uh, demand for soybeans and, and uh, pulling land away from uh, competing crops like corn and cotton, for example. Sure. The uh, growth in the industry has definitely supported vegetable oil prices relative to prices for, for protein meals. We expect that to continue going forward. The policy itself remains uncertain, right? We, we don't know for sure where the renewable fuel standard will be set for future years, how the, the California uh, low-carbon low fuel uh, policy in, in California will be going in forward. And of course, some of those plants that are currently being planned may never be built. If they were all built and, and operated at full capacity, yes, that would provide a lot of support for vegetable oil uh, consumption in this country, pushing up uh, the area that's devoted to soybean area in this country, but also in South America. Uh, in our own projections here, you know, we're, we're probably going to be showing that the United States could actually become a net importer of vegetable oil at some point in the future if those plans were to be carried out uh, to the extent that people are talking about. Yeah, the, the only thing I think I would add to that is, again, going back to the comment earlier that these sorts of things and prospects for the build out of some of that ultimately are, are, are also factoring into things that, that, that get capitalized into things like the value of land. So to the comment earlier about the differences in the Midwest versus further west into the plains, um, you would expect that, that producers or investors or whoever's involved with, with buying that land and expanding is ultimately considering the future prospects associated with that to the extent that, that there's going to be increased demand coming by way of things tied to energy. That's also contributing to, I think, some of what you see in terms of regional differences. I'm Bob Thompson again. <clears throat> uh, Susan broached one of my pet peeves about our national agricultural statistics, and that is the definition of a farm that's imposed by Congress on, on the data collectors. Uh, as far as I know, it's still $1,000 a year. Uh, any place in the country that could produce $1,000 a year produces statistics on the national averages of farms in the United States that are utterly meaningless. And most, the majority of those are hobby farms, uh, rural residences, 
that by no stretch of the imagination view themselves as in the business of farming. Uh, they may do a little farming on the side uh, of their retirement or their rural residence, uh, but to count them in our national averages and and uh, suggest that those averages meaning, mean anything about the economics of agriculture is absurd. Does anyone want to comment? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I get your point. And that last map that I showed, one, one thing we did with that is we looked just at farm businesses because you're right, 50% of all farms are what we call residence farms, meaning their primary occupation isn't farming and they have less than $150,000 in gross cash income a year. So we do do this kind of supplementary set of statistics that look just at these farm businesses, which account for the other 50% of farms, but they account for like 90% of the value of ag sector production. They hold most of the sector's assets and debt. So we do think it's worth giving them a little extra attention because they're such a dominant force in the sector. Yeah, I mean, that, it seems to me that when we talk about the aggregate numbers, we're really talking about the performance of the commercial farms, right? Because these other, the remainder of the two million don't really produce much. So the, other than the, the burden of having to go out and count all these farms all the time, um, the harm to me that's done is that the existence of these two million farms is used to justify payments that go to only 10% of the farms. Um, I wouldn't mind the, you, can, you could define farms however you wanted if it weren't used as sort of a smoke screen to, uh, abs to, to sort of distract attention from the fact that most of the payments are going to a very small number of farms. And, and most Americans, despite what you can report, uh, don't see that. Well, in the next panel, we will we'll be seeing presentations that deal with some of these issues in more detail. Um, I... As a moderator, I want to have the last question, just if I want a couple of minutes of responses. Those small farms include many minority-owned operations where, where the very few, less than 2.5% of families live below, uh, the, have farms live below the poverty line. It seems to me that one of the problems with the statistics we have is we are gloriously ignorant of actually the status of minority farms owned by, for example, African Americans or Native Americans and so on. Uh, is that a fair assessment or is that just me being a mean moderator? Well, I'll jump in just quickly on the ERS and NAS do the Agricultural Resource Management Survey, which is the basis for a lot of the research that we do in ERS. And it is limited on, on like characteristics of race and ethnicity, just in that it is a survey. So we can't sometimes get at you know, a, a sizable enough of these minority or underserved farmers to produce statistics that might be as robust. As so it's one, it's one thing the Farm Bill might be able to do that would be bipartisan, is to improve the information about particularly what we often call underserved communities? Well, Go. I think the, the, to me the question is, when you look at that segment, and as Carrie says, you know, the, the ability to sample what is a, a fairly small number is, is sure. limited. Um, you know, what, what, what are the real drivers of the circumstances of poverty and, uh, that you find on these places? Is it that they're not good farmers or is it something else, right? I mean, is farm policy really the way to address the fact that these are households who aren't doing well, who are poor? And um, I, I think that's part of Josh's point too, which is, well, let's see what we actually, let's assess what we see out there and then decide what to do about it. In farm policy, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? But that's probably not true. I think that's a great note on which to end the session with many thanks to all of our participants in this panel. Uh, we'll take a 10-minute break, 15-minute break? 10-minute break uh, for people to gain some coffee, uh, visit appropriate places, and go from there. Thank you, guys. I'm Joe Glauber, and I'm a non-resident senior a uh, fellow here at AEI and a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute here in DC. Um, 
Our next panel is going to look at the structure of, of U.S. agriculture. I think we heard a lot in the first panel how essentially U.S. agriculture isn't monolithic. It, there's a lot of diversity uh, that farms vary considerably across si uh, size differences, regional differences, uh, occupation, or in terms of enterprise differences, what they grow. Um, and I think it, it we'll, we'll see in this, uh, some of the presentations that we're going to, uh, in this session, is that farming also has changed a lot over time. We've seen a lot of concentration in agriculture. We've seen a uh, uh, larger and larger share of production produced by a smaller and smaller proportion of the farm population. And increasingly, we see a lot of inf income uh, that farm households receive come off the farm. And so what I think is interesting here is sort of what the consequences are of this for farm policy. We have a great panel. Uh, we're going to start off with Jeff uh, Hopkins, who's the chief of the Farm Economy Branch uh, in the Resource and Rural Economy Division at USDA's Economic Research Service. Um, as branch chief, Jeff manages a whole program of research and analysis activities focused on farm household economics um, and finance. And his, his branch carries out uh, uh, just uh, uh, pretty much most of the major statistics that you see about the uh, aggregate indicators on the farm sector. A lot of those come out of, of Jeff's branch. Land ownership, land tenure, land values. He also uh, is lead for the Agricultural Resource Management Survey, uh, this ARM survey that was mentioned before. He'll be followed by Jeff McDonald, who's a, uh, or James, Jim McDonald, who's a research professor at uh, the University of Maryland in the Department of Ag Resources Economics. And Jim, prior to going to Maryland just a few years back, had a very distinguished career at USDA, um, where his research ranged from analysis of the consolidation in livestock production and meat packing, looked at railroad deregulation, a whole number of, of structural issues in agriculture, and he's really one of the lead authorities on this issue um, uh, uh, recognized both here in the U.S. and inter internationally. We're very, very happy to have Jim. And then uh, Jim will be followed by Vince Smith, who, uh, of course, needs no introduction. Uh, he is the soon-to-be professor emeritus at Montana State University and, of course, uh, uh, director of AEI's Agricultural Policy Initiative. Vince has written extensively on farm policy, um, and I think for the last three farm bills, or this will be the third farm bill where you've led uh, AEI's research efforts. Um, and so we're pleased to have Vince. And the, that panel will then be followed by two discussants. And I'm happy that uh, our first dis discussant is Sarah Mock, who's a rural and agricultural uh, freelance writer and research. She's the author of, shameless plug here, Farm and Other F Words, um, and it's follow-up Big Team Farms. Uh, I read this book a couple of years ago when it first came out and uh, on an airplane going somewhere and thought, someday I'd like to have her on a panel because <laughs> I think that, that uh, well, it's, it's, it's quite a good book that looks at a lot of dimensions of structural dimensions of agriculture. And then lastly, we have Billy Hackett, who's a policy, institute, uh, policy specialist at the National Sus uh, Sustainability Agricultural Coalition where he focuses on crop insurance, uh, commodity, and competition issues. Let me just say one a reminder, if you're watching online um, and would like to ask any questions, you can send an email to benjamin.goren, G-O-R-E-N, at AEI.org, or on Twitter, ha just use the hashtag, hashtag AEI Farm Bill, one word. So with that, let me turn to Jeff. Thank you, Joe. And I'm uh, really delighted to be here today to talk about uh, some recent research that we've uh, published at the Economic Research Service, USDA. I'm going to be sharing some um, findings and some numbers from a report called America's Farm, Farms and Ranchers at a Glance. It's the 2021 edition, and we're talking about uh, all data from 2021. So in the previous panel, we heard a little bit about the 22 and 23 forecasts for the farm sector economy. The data that I'm going to be showing is kind of rooted in that 2021 year, which, as you remember, it was a year of strong growth 
um, uh, not peak growth, but it's the most recent uh, snapshot of farms uh, for 2021. All the data comes from the Agricultural Resources Management Survey, uh, which is an annual survey carried out of farms and ranches, uh, all farms that have the potential to produce more than $1,000 of uh, agricultural production in a year. And right now, the 2022 Agricultural Resource Management Survey and the 2022 Agricultural Census is in the field. So I'd like to just take the opportunity to ask people who, uh, who are farms who have received the instrument to uh, please fill it out. Uh, you could consider it a, uh, a letter to Washington, D.C. or a letter to your representative uh, describing your own uh, operation, your own financial situation, and we will take that information, combine it with others, uh, other information, and publish it. So I uh, uh, wanted to take that uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm the, as Joe said, I'm the chief of the farm economy branch, and we, we study everything ag finance related uh, at ERS. So I'll start with a picture just showing the number of uh, farms, a number of farm operations, and the number of acres operated. So the blue line uh, starts out in 1950 and goes through the 2021 data. The blue line is showing acres operated. Uh, about 25% of the acres operated in 1950 are no longer uh, uh, in agricultural production today. So there has been a, a general decline. Uh, the red line is showing the number of farm operations. The number of farm operations uh, has uh, declined about, si about 65% uh, from 1950 to, to 2020. Uh, the most of that decline happened from 1950 to 1970, though, and the number of operations has remained roughly constant at about 2 million farms uh, since uh, 1990. So uh, there wasn't uh, uh, too much variation year to year on number of, operations, uh, number of operations or acres operated over the past several years. So the last panel talked mostly about agriculture as a whole, as the sector, the production agriculture sector, so the uh, crop and livestock operations. There are also other parts of the agricultural sector, support services, upstream, downstream operations, uh, but it was mostly talking about the production sector. We're gonna talk about, in, in this paper, in these results, we're gonna talk about the uh, production sector again, but we're gonna divide those operations into some homogeneous groups so we can get a sense of different uh, sizes of operations um, and, and uh, discuss cash receipts, government payments, and other farm-related income earned by the farm for different farm sizes. Most farms are actually considered uh, family farms. The overwhelming majority of them are, are family farms, about 98%, uh, which just means that uh, the operators and family members own at least 50% of the assets that make up the operation. So most farms are family farms. Um, uh, some of them are non-family farms and we break out statistics for them uh, separately. And as Kerry pointed out in the previous panel, for small farms in particular, we oftentimes will look at the occupation, uh, the main occupation of the, of the principal operator, whether it's farming, whether they're retired, uh, and other measures. So the first uh, broad description that I'm going to show is uh, the percentage of farms, the percentage of uh, farmland and the percent of agriculture production uh, along four different categories. So the top bar in yellow is showing non-family farms and the blue, the orange, and the gray, far and the gray bar are showing uh, uh, different uh, categories by farm size. So small family farms, which we're counting as operations under $350,000 in sales, the mid-sized family farms, which are 350 to a uh, million dollars uh, in gross cash farm income, and the large-scale family farms, which are a million dollars or more. So uh, as pointed out, most uh, farms are small family farms, 
89% or that blue bar in the far left, and uh, uh, 1% are non-family farms, about 6% are mid-size. But if you instead uh, look at the direct population representation, instead of looking at that, you look at their land ownership. And uh, small family farms are about 45% of the land. And I think that is uh, important to point out, it, whereas they're only 18% of the value of production shown on the far right, they do represent a significant share of farmland. Later on, I'll talk about participation in conservation programs, and you see a, a big participation, a big target, I would say, of USDA to try to do outreach to those farms. In uh, 2021, we showed that 17% of the value production came from non-family farms. I'll show a graph of that uh, a, a little bit later about where that's concentrated, but that's a particularly high number for 2021, and it's something that, that we're certainly watching uh, the representation of non-family farms, and hog operations, specialty crops uh, um, is, uh, is, is certainly interesting. Um, Kerry in the previous panel was talking about farm businesses. That's essentially uh, the, the mid-size uh, family farms and the large-scale family farms that are responsible for most of agricultural production in terms of value. This is a chart that's showing the specialization of the farm. So what is uh, the, the, the commodity or group of commodities that represent 50% or more of the value of production on that operation? You can classify that. It's a, a, a mutually exclusive um, uh, sort of categorization. So we have uh, poultry and eggs, hay, beef, hogs, uh, uh, cash grains and soybeans, uh, cotton, dairy, specialty crops. And uh, the blue bar, again, the small family farms, are particularly important for poultry and eggs. And I'll just point out that uh, uh, in the case where there is a lot of contracting going on, uh, that is the producer is not necessarily owning the product, they're selling it under a contract relationship, we only allocate the amount of money earned by, from the fee uh, by the producer, not the full value of production. That's how we uh, allocate that. So we do see you hear that uh, poultry and hog farms are rather large, but there are significant numbers of uh, what we call small family farms, less than $350,000, because we're only giving them credit for the fee that they earn uh, for that production. But poultry and eggs, uh, hogs, beef, all significant uh, shares of small family farms. Uh, in contrast, cotton, dairy, cash grains, made up mostly of uh, large scale family farms with a million more, a million dollars or more uh, in, in gross cash farm income. And as I mentioned before, the non-family farms play an outsized role relative to their uh, representation in farms as a whole in specialty crops and uh, in hog farms. So I'm going to show a couple of measures of, um, of uh, financial uh, stress or uh, financial pressures that uh, are felt by different types of farm operations. Here we're switching from a commodity specialization to the full drawn out farm typology that I talked about before that was looking at not only the, um, the size of the farm, but the primary occupation of the, of the principal operator. So the group that's all the way on the far left, those are retirement farms, and the second group over from the, from the far left are off-farm occupation farms. That's where the principal operator says their main uh, occupation is outside the farm. And what I'm showing here is an operating profit margin. The operating profit margin is essentially net farm income, but we give you a pass on your interest payments. And we also give, in the, in the sense that we don't net those out of uh, farm income, and we also are imposing a charge based on the amount of labor, unpaid labor, that the operator contributes to the farm operation. So uh, that's operating profit margin. We divide all that by uh, the gross cash farm income of the farm, and we create categories. 
the uh, category in orange or, or, or red, uh, the bottom part of, part of the bar, is if the operating profit margin is less than 10%. That isn't saying that you're, that you're necessarily losing money, but your operating profits are less than 10, whereas the yellow bar is between 10 and 25%, and then the green bar is 25% or more operating profit margin. So in terms of all farms, we have 71% uh, of the operations that are uh, operating profit margin of less than 10%, but that's a direct population uh, average, and that is mostly made up of retirement farms and off-farm occupation farms whose primary objective may not be to make money off the farm operation. In contrast, you have large, very large, and non-family farms where most of those operations are actually in the yellow or the green space. Another measure that you could construct of um, uh, financial pressure is the current ratio. So the current ratio is basically looking at short-term assets and short-term debt, and it's creating a, a ratio of those two terms, and it's looking at whether it's greater or less than one. The green bar is showing the share of the categories that have, uh, re that, that have more than enough assets to cover current assets, so that'd be cash on hand, cash-like things, inventories, things they could convert into cash, uh, and the yellow bar is showing those operations whose uh, debts are, are greater than their current assets on hand. So for all farms, the current uh, ratio is in a very comfortable position, indicating low levels of financial stress, 57% uh, in the green zone and, and uh, 42 in, uh, in the yellow zone. Um, the... the uh, uh, and that measure improves as you get to larger and larger farm operations. One point that I would make with this measure, though, is that the current debt, we're including things like uh, property taxes and other sorts of accounts payable that are always kind of technically in arrears. So when you see a large share of retirement farms, off-farm occupation farms in that yellow zone, it may be that they're cash flowing those sorts of expenses from activities that are off the farm. Or maybe they're at such low levels that they can simply flow it, cash flow it off of current income rather than off uh, assets that they have on hand. So in general, the, the current ratio uh, uh, measure is uh, indicating uh, low levels of stress among large farm operations, but it does vary by farm size. Okay, so uh, the other comparison that we like to make uh, transcends the farm operation boundaries and looks at all the sources of income that come from uh, that the farm household has to draw on. So every farm operation will have a farm household associated with it. And in 2021, farm households it, farm household incomes did not, in general, have low income at the median. And you see a very uh, strong in increase in household income as you increase uh, in farm size across that farm typology. And for comparison, we have two other indicators from the general population. The first one is the red line, which is showing the overall um, uh, household income of the, uh, the general uh, population, which is about well, was about $70,000 in 2021. And except for retirement farms and low sales uh, farm households, in general, the uh, uh, median household income for farm, for those types of farm, for all types of farm operations were greater than the population of average. Now you might want to go beyond that and look at far, look at households in the general population that were, that had self-employment income, because that is probably more like a farm, more like a farm, uh, who are self-employed. And that number is slightly higher uh, for, the, for the U.S. population. It's closer to uh, $95,000, $96,000 in 2021. And still, uh, for the most part, uh, farm, op farm households have higher levels of, of income. Um, sorry about that. 
Um, so that's what I'll say uh, about farm household income. I also wanted to talk quickly just about government payments. Um, and uh, what, this is, what this chart is showing are the same uh, categories in the farm typology that we had uh, before, but it's showing government payments uh, not by uh, participation as a whole, but by type of program. And we had about 35% of, of farm households who, per who participated in government programs as a whole, um, which is actually down from 2020. We had about 40% in 2020. Uh, um, but it's highly uh, uh, distributed in terms of type of program. So the green bar in, among all these groups is showing participation in conservation programs, and that includes the Conservation Reserve Program and the Environment Quality Incentive Program. So working land, uh, uh, it ex the green bar is just showing uh, the Conservation Reserve Program, so a land retirement program, highly uh, uh, skewed towards retirement farms, off-farm occupation farms, and low sales farms. The, the brown bar, the one right next to it, is showing working, uh, working uh, land conservation programs like the Conservation uh, Security Program and the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. That is distributed much like the value of production across the farm typology. That is shown in the blue bars is showing value of production. So you see strong participation uh, among uh, uh, mid-sized family farms and large family farms, largely representative of their value of production. Uh, we also show the pandemic assistance, which is the middle bar, and who participated in pandemic assistance uh, across the, the typology. And there I would also, you know, it's, it's largely uh, correlated to value of production. And then we have um, all other payments, which are farm bill programs, uh, Title I programs, uh, uh, and um, uh, ad hoc and supplementary programs. So except for the, uh, the, conser the uh, Conservation Reserve Program, in general, participation tends to run along the lines of the value of production of, of uh, on farms. Talk a little bit about the pandemic assistance that was uh, still around very strongly in 2021. Uh, so this is COVID-19 relief that came from the um, uh, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, the CFRAP program, though that uh, is shown in the blue bars, um, or the Pandemic Assistance Program more broadly, whereas the orange uh, bar is showing, I'm sorry, yeah, the orange bar is showing the um, Paycheck Protection Program, which was run by the Small Business Administration. And in 2021, it was actually the case that there was more money given to the agricultural sector from the Small Business Administration than from the USDA uh, Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. We talked a little bit about uh, indemnities, uh, crop insurance indemnities. This chart is showing participation uh, and it's uh, showing the um, acres enrolled in orange and the level of indemnities in gray. So uh, um, except for uh, very large farms and retirement farms, uh, you see uh, pretty much proportional participation in program with, uh, in, with uh, crop insurance indemnities. Uh, very strong participation in off-farm occupation, low sales, moderate sales, mid-size and, and large farms. We see uh, a distribution of uh, participation to be pretty broadly, uh, uh, the, the program is, uh, touches all types, but uh, the actual indemnities and acres enrolled are very strongly uh, correlated or very strongly concentrated in large and very large farms. So like uh, government payments as a whole, you see a concentration in large farms and very large farms. Uh, overall, I just uh, wanna reiterate that we find farming is still overwhelmingly a family business. It's always been uh, the case that, that uh, 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 
related people tend to own farms and operate them jointly. Uh, the share of farms with a uh, uh, low risk operating profit far margin, it varies uh, greatly by farm size. And uh, just to, to mention again that most of the pandemic assistance was actually from the Small Business Administration in 2021. Uh, like I said, mo most of this data can be found in a report uh, that Noah Miller and colleagues uh, Christine Witt and Ryan Olver put together at USDA. Thank you. Jeff, excellent. Uh, thanks so much. I, I think that really sets up the, the discussion. Uh, Jim, do you want to follow? All right, ready to go. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, there we go. The title of my talk is Farm Consolidation, Three Implications for Farm Policy. What I'm going to do is give you four facts about consolidation in agriculture. Really, that's like four slides. Um, I'm going to do this based on my past work. I reference a couple of those, one, a, uh, ER, one an ERS report and one a, a recent journal article. Uh, the data largely comes from the Census of Agriculture. The most recent one was 2017. I also have one slide that's drawing on arms, which takes us a little further up. Um, you know, this stuff is easily extended into the future with 2022 census data, which is in, as Jeff mentioned, in collection now. So I'm going to give you four facts about consolidation and three implications that I see from that work for policy. Uh, let me start with basic background chart. What we're doing here is tracking the share of cropland acres in the United States in six different size categories from 1987 through the 2017 census, so over 30 years. The blue area is small farm, less than 100 acres, if we're defining on an acreage category here. The green is 2,000 acres or more, all right? So what you can see is over time, I think two things. First, a large shift of acreage to the largest size category, 2,000 or more acres. Second, it's a persistent shift, a steady increase over time every census year. So I want to keep that in mind, large and persistent. Notice a couple of more aspects of this. Really nothing's happening to the share in the blue, small farms less than 100 acres. They maintain their share. Nothing really is going on in the share in the red, which is 1,000 to 2,000 acres. All of the shift is what we might think of, call it mid-sized crop farms, 100 to 999 acres, those, uh, the brown, gray, and yellow um, areas. All of the shift is from those on net to the large category. And the large category has shifted from, they were 15% of acreage in 1987. By 2017, it's 35% of acreage is in farms with at least 2,000 acres or more. A large persistent shift over time. I'll break this down a little more. The chart breaks some of that message down to five major field crops. Uh, corn, cotton, uh, am I reading this? Wheat, soybeans, and, and rice. Um, what I'm showing here in this bar chart is the midpoint size of an operation in each of these seven census years going from 1987 through 2017. At the midpoint, half of all acres are on larger farms, half of all acres are on smaller farms. So it's, it's a median, it's not what we'd normally think of as the median farm size. It's technically the distribution of acres by farm size. And we've got some labels here. So if you look all the way under corn, in 1987, the midpoint was 200 acres. That is, half of all corn acres in the United States in 1987 came from farms harvesting at least 200 acres of corn and half came from farms harvesting less than 200 acres. That midpoint increased over time to 685 acres by 2017. So again, corn acreage shifted to much larger operations. And what you see here for these five crops is something quite similar to the last picture in the sense that the changes from 87 to 2017 are large in every crop. 
They're really big. Secondly, they're persistent. It increases in every census year for every crop, with the one exception of, if you notice, cotton declines from 2007 to 2012 and then bounces up again. So again, large persistent shifts. Now I'm going to add another adjective, which is ubiquitous. It's all five of these crops. So that's not such a big deal. But we did the same thing for 55 crops that the census reports over that time, including not just field crops, but fruits, vegetables, nuts, melons. And we saw this picture for 53 out of 55 crops. That is, increases in that midpoint over time, which is our measure of consolidation. The increases are large. They're persistent over time as well. And they occur in almost all crops. We don't really see any difference in the rate of consolidation between, say, field crops and different uh, specialty crops. OK, I'll give you one table now. This is livestock. Livestock's a little different than what we saw in crops. We get large changes, but they tend to be episodic and sometimes radical. Episodic mean some inner census periods we don't get really any consolidation going on. But in the years when we do, it's quite big. Let's drop down to the bottom row, which is milk cows. Midpoint herd size of 80. That means 1987, half of all milk cows in the country were on farms that have herds of larger than 80. Half were on farms with less than 80 cows. You can see what's really a radical change over time. By 2017, that midpoint is at 1,300. It will be considerably bigger in 2022, I'm sure of that. So a major, major shift to much larger operations. If you look at other rows right above it, egg layers, a tenfold increase in that midpoint size. Call it the average size from the point of view of the hen. Drop drop up a little further to hogs and pigs. Another, we, and, and we know this from other ERS work, that we have really revolutionary changes in how we organize those industries. And you see this dramatic change in midpoints there. At the same time, some places you don't get much change at all. Uh, fed cattle had a big increase until the mid-90s. Not much change in the organization of fed cattle since then. If you look at beef cows a little bit lower, you know, a modest change in over time. In fact, the only part of agriculture where we don't see major consolidation over time is in cow-calf operations and related pasture and rangeland. You know, in all crops and in most livestock species, we see very large changes in consolidation measured in this way. OK, first of my three policy implications. You know, commodity programs largely are directed to producers of selected field crops. But we see consolidation across almost all crop and livestock commodities. And in the background reports, we see very little systematic difference in rates of change between program crops and everything else. So one implication that I draw is I doubt that commodity and conservation programs are major drivers of consolidation. I can tell you specific stories over specific periods or specific commodities in which I think policy matters. But for the most part, what I see is technology, sometimes constrained by location, as the primary driver of consolidation. OK, my fourth fact is household incomes, which I think some people in the previous panel uh, uh, we're giving me a lead in, too. Okay, this is the same chart on two slides. I'll take this slide to talk about what we're seeing and the next slide to talk about uh, what the implications are. What I'm showing is median household income for three different groups. And for farms, household income, as Jeff mentioned earlier, consists of the net income from the farm flowing to the household, plus off-farm income flowing to the household. We have um, adjusted these for inflation in two ways, because I've sorted farms here into small farms using the ERS definition of 350000 or less in sales for a small farm. And then I've lumped large and mid-sized farms together. 
So we adjust that for inflation, that threshold with the producer price index for farm products. Incomes, we adjust for inflation with the uh, CPI. What I've got is the solid black line is all US households. Uh, and then the dash lines, I got small farm households and then combined large and mid-sized farms. Let me just talk about the facts here now. What we see for small farms is actually, we're picking this up at the beginning of arms in 1996. Uh, if you look at Bruce Gardner's textbook, now 20 years old, the tract from various sources, this kind of measure back to the 30s, and said, you know, in the 30s, farm households were a significant part of the po poverty population. And incomes, household incomes, as near as we can tell, were, cons were far below average US household incomes. And if you follow Bruce's charts, they're growing over time. And as he gets to the mid 90s, then to his data, it's just getting up to the all US average. So if we track our small farms here, which are, of course, as we know, almost all farms statistically, they catch up to the all US average and grow compared to it. So I would say in the last decade and a half, they're noticeably above the all US average, consistent with data I think Jeff just showed you for 2021. But jump up to large and mid-sized farms. Their median household income fluctuates a lot from year to year, but there is a strong and powerful trend there in real terms. Another aspect of policy implication. Over time, consolidation is shifting program crop production to larger farms. So that today, using the 2021 arms data, 74% of the value of production of program crops is held by large and mid-sized family farms. Payments tend to follow production for program crops. So that means in policy, we are steadily shifting payments, whether it's crop insurance subsidies or commodity program payments, to higher income households as production is shifting to larger farms. The other point that we haven't made often in our reports is median income for those large and mid-sized farms on trend is growing a lot. If I run a trend line through that, I, what we've got over 25 years is a growth in the trend projection for household income of $120,000 a year. This is in real terms, adjusted for inflation. So uh, we are shifting payments to higher income households, both because of the consolidation and the practice of the design of the programs. But in addition, those, in, those households in turn have sharply rising household incomes over time. Third policy implication, which is more the dog that didn't bark. These are really large changes. My measure that I did not mention, but it's in the reports, of the cropland midpoint goes from 589 acres in 1982 to 1445 in 2017. A large, large shift to cropland and much larger farms. The livestock shifts can be quite radical. We've had a two-thirds reduction in licensed dairy herds over the last 20 years. I would say a 30% reduction in the last five years. 80% decline number of farms with hogs. So radical changes in how we organize those industries. And by and large, we don't do anything about it. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I think it's a fact of policy. It's something I would have a hard time expecting the Europeans to follow, to not do anything about radical changes. I think that's a fact of what we've done. We let structural and technological change happen, although we don't talk about it much. But, but I think, to me, that is a fact of our policy designs. Um, and I'll leave us with that. Great. Jim. Vince, you're up. Oh, you, well, you get that too. Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in some ways, I'm going to follow on directly from what Jim was talking about in terms of the focus of this talk is work based um, on uh, uh, a series of uh, studies carried out by Eric Belasco, Anton Beckerman, and myself. And, and I'm in the lowercase list there, and they're in the uppercase list. Um, several years ago, 
it was frustrating to find relatively little information about where farm subsidies actually go, what farms are getting those subsidies. Uh, and we relied heavily on two data sources for the work you're going to see. One is the ARMS data set, uh, which is extremely important. And the other is the um, Census of Agriculture because of under and oversampling problems within the ARMS data. So these, the numbers you will see are corrected to better reflect what is out there in terms of uh, farms than is represented in the raw numbers in the ARMS data set. And that's not to criticize the ARMS data set. That's to say it's very difficult to get good responses from a wide range of uh, uh, participants. Um, so these numbers I don't really need to go through because they've been discussed by everybody else. Um, uh, and they reflect uh, really interesting numbers. Uh, if you look at this, the, if you go from the smallest in terms of crop sales to the 50% uh, point of number of farms in crop sales, um, total crop sales in 2019 were about 12% of the total. Um, average total farm household income wealth for that group was about $800,000. Uh, as you moved up, um, these numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and you get to the very largest of farms, which are the top 1% of farms, that produce a very substantial amount of total output compared to the numbers of farms. And you're looking at, at extraordinarily uh, wealthy farms, at least in terms of assets and, and presumably in terms of income. And that's not counting, um, the, the assets are not necessarily counting uh, non-farm assets held by those families, although we think that's probably likely. Um, in 2019, we published a report that looked at what is now being widely called the farm income safety net. That consists of the major price slash per acre revenue driven program known as ARC PLC, Agricultural Risk Coverage, Price Loss Coverage. And we also looked at the federal crop insurance program based on 2015 data. Um, so, uh, if we take a look, and this is how we've organized the numbers in that study, we've ordered the, we've ordered the numbers going from the smallest 10% of farms in terms of sale to the largest 10% of farms in sales. And we provide two sets of information in, in this picture. One is, um, what is the total of... Uh, all subsidies from these programs uh, for each, uh, what's the average amount in each of those categories of 10 percenters? And if you look at the top 10 percent of farms uh, in 2050, I'm sorry, in 2014, they were averaging nearly $60,000 per farm in payments. Um, and they accounted for just over 60 percent of all subsidies. As you move down to the 80 to 90% range, you get another 30% of all subsidies under those two programs. Um, and you see, uh, sorry, you get uh, another 20% under those two programs at a, a just under 20,000, about $17,000 per farm in average payments. And as you go forward, it gets smaller and smaller. And once you get below, um, the 40 to 50% range, it's not a measurable number. I think the actual number for the lowest 10% of farms, many of which has been pointed out are hobby farms, uh, was $11 uh, per farm, which is maybe enough to buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks today. Well, maybe two. Uh, so clearly we, what Jim just said certainly held uh, then. Um, if you look at the proportion of farms that raised crops that received payments from either of these programs, they range from almost none. That's the, the um, if I can read this correctly, that's the uh, yellow line uh, for the lowest percentile, up to over 50% for the top 10%, and about the same number for the uh, 80 to 90% of farms by size. So clearly all these permits, as Jim just said, are heavily concentrated on large farms, large operations. But that comes back to a remark that was made earlier uh, in, in um, 
uh, I think this session and the last session, which is if the purpose of this program, is, as, as Susan Offit pointed out, is to save the family farm, and you're thinking about these mid-sized family farms between 40 and in the range of 40 to 60 percent uh, in terms of number of farms, the money is not going there. The money is going to the large farms uh, in large amounts. And one number that I'm not going to share with you in a picture is the following. In this study, we found that nearly 70 percent of all of these subsidies went to producers of three crops. Those were soybeans, corn, and wheat. And 94% went to six crops, which were those three, plus rice, plus cotton, and the crop that gets per acre the most money out of the federal government, which is peanuts. And that's the other crop that takes the system. And things have not changed much at all in the last uh, several years. Um, uh, this is the distribution of uh, the um, farm income price, uh, income support program numbers. Very similar patterns um, in terms of average payments by farm size in 2014. Um, we did a, we, Eric and I did a new study that was published, um, uh, part of which was published in um, uh, Food Policy and part of which was uh, in a special report that Eric prepared for um, Bill, Billy Watson. Thank you, the National Sustainable Ag Coalition. Uh, and we looked at uh, particularly crop insurance subsidies averaged over a seven, uh, eight year period, again using the arms data and um, the um, uh, weighted by information from the census, the agricultural census. And if you look at the average share of total federal crop insurance subsidies by farm size, that's measured by crop sales, this pattern comes across very loudly. Um, the smallest 50% of farms, that's the black group right on the, on, uh, the uh, right, I never get this right, right hand side. I, I, I would always enter stage wrong if I were an actor. Um, the... Um, about 20% goes to what are largely the medium-sized farms uh, or smaller commercial farms that Jeff was talking about. Um, and the rest goes to the largest farms, the 20% to the 80 to 90% size farms, 20% um, to the 90 to 95% largest farms, 25.5% uh, when you get up from the 95 to the 99% of largest farms, and 10% goes to the largest 1% of farms. So it's clear where these payments are skewed. And from a policy point of view, I think what these numbers do is reinforce exactly what Jim just said. This is not a pro these are not programs targeted to need. They're targeted to large farms, uh, and often the lobbyists uh, will come forward from the farm sector talking about probably the 50 to 80% size farms, but that's not where most of the money goes. Um, uh, if we look at the uh, total crop insurance subsidies uh, in terms of shares, um, that's the blue line. Uh, the share is obviously concentrated again very heavily on the larger farms. And an interesting thing uh, that, uh, is a, that came out of this study the yellow lines here show payments per acre by farm size under these programs. They're minimal, of course, for very small farms. They are the largest for very large farms. So it's not merely the case that large farms get more money because they have more acres. They get larger payments per acre. So in terms of farm policy, which is largely driven by production, they get a double whammy, if you like, well, not whammy, a double benefit of, uh, from these programs. Um, we, uh, my colleague Eric uh, was asked to look at uh, what would be the effect of payment limitations. Jim noted in his talk that payment limits have been discussed in, what, the last five farm bills, Jim? Roughly speaking, give or take, uh, and have never got very far. 
The simplest uh, approach would be to cap crop insurance premium subsidies for each farm. And uh, Eric looked at a very generous cap of $50,000 per farm. And the question was, how many of these, how many farms in that bracket would, uh, it, uh, how many farms, if the cap were $50,000, would be actually affected at all in terms of the crop insurance subsidies they received? And these are subsidies for premium paid, not indemnities. And the answer was 3.5% of all farms that top 95%, which would still get $50,000 in subsidy. And the rest of the world, no impact. Um, there have been other proposals that have been put forward, most of which I suspect would be ignored because they're too complicated. But this is just indicative of the impact on farms of a $50,000 cap, uh, which parenthetically is way more than the poverty line uh, for most uh, households in the United States. And what would the savings be? They would be roughly 1.6 billion a year, 16 billion over a uh, 10 year period. And that reflects roughly about, um, about 25 to 30% of the monies that go to farms through the crop insurance program. Uh, it's important to remember that a third of all crop insurance payments uh, uh, all crop insurance subsidies from the government actually are paid to crop insurance companies. And crop insurance is a very expensive way of giving farmers money, by the way. But that's a topic for a different time. So with that, I just want to say thank you for listening and thank you for having me. Well, thank you, me, for having me. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, Vince, what can I say? Sarah? Yeah, Absolutely. Um, what a great presentation. So much good data here to talk about. Um, and now I have this remote, so I guess I could go crazy and just see what else is in here. Um, no, I just have a few comments here that I'll make, and then I'm very excited to get into the heart of the discussion, which this is a big topic. But I think I'm uniquely positioned on this panel to be able to talk about a couple of things. The main one being, I think, pointing out perhaps the obvious reality, but one that bears uh, saying out loud, I think, in a room like this, when people the vast majority of people in this town say small family farm. They are not talking about a real data specified group. They, the word small family farm is not meant to be understood. It's meant to be felt in your heart. It is the description of, you know, something that I think arguably, it certainly does not or cannot exist today. It may have never existed at all. I think there's reasonably argue that the idea of kind of our pastoral heritage and legacy that is encapsulated by the idea of the small family farm is misleading at best. Uh, I think it bears talking a little bit about what exactly the words small family farm do for us and why they're so close and why like put it protects small family farms on any piece of policy and you it becomes untouchable and very scary for people to talk about critically. Uh, you know, what does small mean? When you attach it to the words family farm, it implies not only kind of a subsistence scale, which is never true of businesses in America and is silly that we would ever think that it would. It also implies, you know, community focus and kind of um, a, a deep sense of, you know, this isn't a profit seeking business that's out there to grow and advance like we would assume all businesses are. Small family farms are small because they care first about serving the community, they care about family values, they care about, you know, whatever the essential heart-focused principles of being American are. I, we've looked at a lot of data that shows that 90, 98% of farms in the United States are family-owned and operated, and it turns out that does not actually do anything for how they think of themselves as businesses. Um, we also know that the vast majority of farms are small, and we can debate a lot about what the data is for that, and how many of those farms are real, and how many of those farms even think of themselves as farms. But I think it's clear that the idea that there is a huge cohort of small businesses out there that are focused on something other than growth and kind of professional progress is uh, not borne out by the data, as we've seen. Um, you know, family, I think, works in a similar way in the word small family farm, which is that it implies, you know, some other kind of ethic other than profit-seeking, uh, which 
I think we've proven clear is not the case. Perhaps family businesses have a bit more longevity or a sense of like the greater passage of time than non-family businesses, but the research there I think is complex at best. And I think amongst farms in particular, uh, our long vision of how historic the average family farm in America is, is kind of silly. Uh, a lot of small family farms, especially like big heritage farms, right, are talking about like being started in the early 1900s. We have much older businesses than that in America that aren't attached to land. Um, so I think thinking about the idea of how farms are organized and how farm business, how we think about and look at farm businesses, you know, obviously the data is very important and creates a more compelling conversation and it should certainly be considered in the policy discussion, is it considered? When we use words like small family farm, I think is another question altogether. Um, I'll wrap up with a few. I love to just uh, be the economic student that I was. And given that I do not have the advanced degrees that uh, our, my prestigious panelists do, I will just do the, the thing that good economic students do, which is hopefully point out the obvious in a couple of the graphs we saw. Um, going back to, I mean, I guess I could go back. How fast can I do it? So fast. Because um, there was some good stuff in here. This graph. So small family farms, right? The thing that we love, the thing that we think is like the center that despite the fact that we give most of our farm subsidies to these big farm businesses, it's, it, right, there's some kind of sense that like it's fine as long as some, some of it gets to the right farms. Some of it gets to the farms that we really care about and that really need the help. Not least because I think one of the biggest arguments you'll hear in this town is because small family farms or family farms feed America. Well, this graph would beg to differ. I think of the edible things on this graph, obviously we're looking at specialty crops as a huge one, dairy, hogs, beef, poultry, and eggs. Specialty crops and hogs, primarily not carried out by small family farms. In fact, non-family farms are a huge part of the specialty crop game, an increasing part of dairy, uh, obviously a big part of hogs, and I think even in beef and poultry there would be an increasing part going forward. I think you could think of maybe your average meal, think about how central beef and poultry are to those, but you know, I think our, the preeminence and focus on family ownership in agriculture is kind of nonsensical when you like really think about it, especially because when you think about who is actually feeding America, seems like an awful lot of non-families, non-family businesses are doing quite a bit of the work, which seems relevant to think about if food security is a primary driver of these discussions. Um, let's look at any of these graphs are great. I think it's worth pointing out just to really put a finger on it. These first four categories, retirement, off-farm, low sales, moderate sales, maybe is kind of on the cusp, but those first three in particular, hobbies. If you are retired and you have a farm, that farm is a hobby. If you primarily work not on the farm, that farm is a hobby. If your farm is doing a particularly low amount of sales, like may say $30,000 a year or less, I think that arguably that's a hobby. I think even moderate sales farms would probably fall into a, a hobby situation a lot. Thinking about that and how big of a kind of percentage of total farms that group makes up, how, let's, let's all have a moment to think about our policy as trying to target a group of people who primarily farm as a hobby. Is that the, do, is, should the federal government, government be in the business of supporting people financially to do their hobbies? I think that is a relevant question for us to talk about. Um, and then to jump ahead just a little bit, I think this graph maybe more than anything else is a really prominent one because I think you can talk, uh, Susan did a great job in the earlier presentation, but you know, I think we have an idea that out there in the world of small family farmers, there is a particularly poor cohort who is in desperate need of this kind of support and that, again, we're justifying all farm payments and all farm policy to be able to, at some point, reach that kind of level. But even when we break it out from with large and mid-sized farms separate and small farms by themselves, they are still richer than the average American, richer in income and in assets, which is not represented in this graph. But we know that for, for a fact, actually, when we look at, um, like the graph from earlier about equity and assets and debt, Small, the smallest farms actually have the most equity and the least debt of any farm. It's because if you've retired to a farm or you have other income, you're, it's easier to manage those cash flows, right? I think this graph, when we think about farm payments then, is kind of a transparent 
I don't know how you don't draw the conclusion that we are redistributing wealth upwards in this country through farm payments. We are taking tax payments, tax income, that is contributed by all people, mostly people on that black line, and we are giving it to people who make significantly more income. What does all this mean on the policy level? I think the reality is, is that the small family farm myth is very durable. It's un largely unchallenged politically. It is very kind of cross-sectional. People in America love the small family farm idea. They will fight for it. They will, you, again, you can put that word on any policy and people will support it and you will be hung for not supporting it. But I think perhaps, or and perhaps, the, maybe the conclusion of that is we have in the last five years seen an explosion in farm support, especially non-farm bill farm support. We have taken a lot of genies out of the bottle. We have included more commodities than ever before in these payment programs. We have expanded to more payments all the time, despite the fact that in those same five years, we've seen the largest growth in commodity prices, kind of farm incomes and assets, um, farmland values have increased to, a, I think we can debate about like the extent that it is perhaps a bubble. Um, but I think it is arguable that given the increase in climate change and the risks that that poses and how that will affect crop insurance programs, you know, as we go forward, these expenses seem only to get higher and eventually there will come a day where there is a reckoning with farm programs where the American people maybe have some questions about what exactly is a small family farm, how are we supporting them, why is the farm bill so expensive? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think b probably before we um, have a real reckoning about what it means to be a farmer in America, we will have some kind of farm bill crisis that leads to, I don't know, the, not, the failure to pass a farm bill, perhaps. Sarah, thanks. Billy, you get the last word sure. until the questions. All righty. Well, hey there, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I represent the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Collectively, we represent about 130 member organizations uh, representative of the diversity of American agriculture. We have a lot of small to mid-sized growers, a lot of diversified growers, specialty crop growers, organic growers, right, uh, beginning farmers, et cetera. And we, as a coalition, along with allies in our space, daily, right, hear from, work from, and try to represent here in Washington, D.C., those voices and these farmers who aren't represented by those aggregate statistics that we were looking at earlier in the day during our first panel, right? And so, you know, to kind of segue from the conversations, from the statistics that we're looking at, the conversation that we're having, right, to shift the focus for a moment on those uh, smaller farmers, right, or those diversified farmers, those beginning farmers who are trying to break into farming, for whatever reason that is, you know, I hear frequently working on crop insurance policies, working on the safety net risk management policies set forth by the federal government and the farm bill, right? These programs are not working for these small farmers, right? And if the goal of farm policy and farm programs and the safety net specifically is to lend a hand, right? To support farmers uh, and to support them specifically against the many risks of farming, we're doing that really well for the top, right? Uh, largest 20% uh, of farms, even better for the top 10% of farms, even better than the top 1% of farms, as all those numbers that Vince laid out for us. But we're failing the zero to 80% of farms who simply don't have access to federal farm safety net programs. And there's, I think, a lot of times a misconception here. Certainly, there's a point at which, you know, if you have a garden in your backyard, right, we, we shouldn't be thinking about, right, how can the federal government support that particular operation. But there does come a point where you have a skin in the game, right, and there's a misconception that these people don't want access to federal programs. These people don't want a safety net or insurance. But oftentimes, it's just so far out of the realm of possibility for these producers that they don't think about it. It's not that they don't necessarily want it. And in conversations that I've been having, that we've been having, right, with farmers across the country, and recognizing if there were a safety net designed for these farms, right, that's affordable, right, and that will provide reasonable coverage, folks would buy into that program, right? Because when we're thinking about insurance and the farm safety net, again, it's to protect against those unforeseen risks that you cannot see coming. 
a lot of these smaller farms, diversified farms, et cetera, are actively building resilience on their farms in different ways, right? They don't need, or oftentimes the conception is, those farm safety net programs because they've diversified their production, they've diversified their markets, they've diversified the revenue streams, right? They've built redundancies into their operation. And so the thought is, I don't need a purchase insurance because I'm as covered as I can be. But with the you know, mention of climate change just a little bit earlier, you know, whatever you want to call it and however you want to think about that, we are seeing increasingly devastating weather-related events in this country, right? Whether that's droughts, sudden floods, sudden frosts, et cetera, the derechos in the Midwest, they're getting worse and they're becoming more frequent. And even a farmer that diversifies and protects against that can't protect against what is coming and what is already happening. And so something that we think about often is how can we improve access to these programs, right? But to take a step back, and the Farm Bill is an opportunity to do that, right? To streamline access to these programs, et cetera. And at a values level to question who are we supporting through our farm policies, but to take a step back and to look at the programs writ large, right? to look at the subsidization and what these, this does represent, what this does incentivize. Our farm safety net programs, uh, the subsidization of the largest and wealthiest farms in this country, it, it doesn't really reflect risk, right? And we can think about risk in a lot of different terms and in a lot of different ways, and I think most often, risk is thought of from the perspective of, right, that, that operating profit margin, right? How close are you to failing fiscally? But when we think about risk from a different perspective, right, when we think about risk of, uh, you know, to these different weather-related events, or we can think about risk, right, uh, of, you know, sudden revenue shocks, et cetera, it becomes clear that the largest, you know, monoculture commodity farms do possess a higher risk profile than do small diversified farms, right, who again are building soil health, right, are diversifying revenue streams so that they're selling into various markets and to various people, right? And we saw during the pandemic that the largest farms weren't able to quickly adapt when their markets were suddenly not available to them, right? And we saw, as we all recall and remember, uh, animals euthanized, food simply dumped and wasted and rotting in the fields because large farms weren't able to adapt to those changing circumstances, whereas small farms were able to adapt and fill some of those gaps for Americans with enough privilege or the ability to, to right, look to local regional food production. But when we think about our policies, right, they actively incentivize, through subsidization, this kind of commodity farming, right, because so much money is going to farmers who grow corn and wheat and soybeans, et cetera. This is not to vilify any of those farmers, but it is to say that's an attractive option to continue growing or to choose to grow if you're getting into farming. There's no incentive because subsidization is so good for these farmers year after year. There's no incentive to consider adopting conservation practices or adopting risk mitigation practices on your farm. Why would you innovate? There's no need when you know that you're protected by a safety net that has your back and that always pays out. And so essentially we're talking about the artificial removal of risk from what are inherently high risk operations and completely leaving out the farmers who do possess, uh, again, more redundancies and thus are less risky. Um, uh, from, from the perspective that I've been speaking to, right? We think about good driver's discounts on your car insurance, right? But that isn't reflected in our insurance policies for agriculture. So I think I can stop there and we can yeah, Great. move to questions. Super. Okay, I want to take some questions from the audience, uh, but I'm going to use my prerogative to start with, with, actually I have a whole bunch of questions, but I think I'll, I'll try to limit it at least uh, last Thursday, Secretary of, of, of Agriculture, uh, Tom Vilsack, was, spoke at the Outlook Forum, and he commented on the fact that we had record farm income. And, but then he said, and, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, but d essentially, despite the fact that you have record farm income, there's all these farms that have negative farm income. There's all these farms that are, are essentially losing money, or they're, they need supplemental to supplement that income by working off farm. 
you know, I just comment on that a little bit. And I'm not looking necessarily, Jeff, you don't have to feel you need to jump in on this one. Uh, but it, it's, is this the right narrative? Is this, you know, we heard that, that farming actually has evolved a lot. And, you know, I, and off-farm work has been an enormous part of farm household income for a number of years. This isn't something that just happened overnight. I would have three comments. I, I would to expect more. But. Well, no, because in some ways, I don't want to preempt Jim. Uh, but comment number one is, families having two incomes is the absolute norm in any U.S. household where there are two adults who are of working, are capable of working. It's the absolute norm. So, so that's the first comment. Second comment is, People do go into farming, and I've got lots of anecdotes, but you should always be cautious of anecdotes, of young people who have farm management skills who go into farming in very small increments because they take a job, say, with the farm credit system or with uh, an agricultural uh, machinery company or something like that, and they edge in to farming. Uh, they are using their off-farm income to enable them to deal with what are, what are absent massive crop insurance, inherently risky uh, initiatives. But the third point is, if you myopically only look at one year, you are misunderstanding what is relevant for the farmer, the farm family. And... Jim, if you don't mind, I'll use your picture. Take a look at that upper line. There's a lot of year-to-year -year volatility in that line. There are periods where income tends to be below average, and then there are periods where it's a bountiful year. And from certainly the 1930s, and probably from time immemorial, farmers have understood that they they go through the lean years to benefit from the big years. Uh, and to say farm income is going to be lower next year, and we will hear that a lot in the policy debates, uh, is very misleading because you need to understand that the farms don't take that view at all. The f you know, farmers who are going to be in this for a long time say, we have ups and downs. Uh, we are going to take all sorts of approaches to managing the years where we have low income. Off-farm work is a primary source of that. And um, so when the Secretary of Agriculture, bless his heart, comes out and says we're looking at lower income next year, it is comprehensively a misleading statement whether he intended it to be or not. Jim. Let me fill in as long as we're on my chart. <laughs> that top red line, bear in mind, is highly averaged, right? It's a median across all large and mid-sized farms. Some years ago, uh, we at IRS dug more into arms because uh, some farms show up multiple years in arms, typically large and mid-sized farms. Maybe we sample them 20% of the time, so, you know, they're going to show up every fifth year. So we're able to look at those individual farms and take a look at the variance of their earnings. And of course, if I shouldn't say of course, but it really is pretty dramatic. People that have average household incomes over 20 year period of say 200,000 have years in which they've got minus 50 or plus 350. So there is, as we noticed, it's a risky business. There are sharp fluctuations up and down. Uh, and every year we can find large commercial farms uh, that are losing money, who actually make a great deal of money over time. Um, and also, as Vince pointed out, there's an awful lot of people for whom uh, combining a small-scale farm business, earning about with sales of 10 to 50 to 100,000, with off-farm work, uh, whether it's as a teacher, as an insurance broker, or working for a feed company, 
uh, makes a lot of sense for them. They like doing it, they earn a little extra money. Uh, so, and that's a major part of, uh, of agriculture for many years. I, I don't see it going away, and I see it as a positive choice for the people who are making those decisions. So, that's a minor detail. India is going to have losses. Yeah. yeah. Well, make enough set their tax liabilities on their other income. That's which right. Is All right. Not a issue. Let's move on. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say that is a very not trivial issue. I mean, we the USDA is so aware of. It, I shouldn't say the USDA. The IRS is so aware of the use of farms as tax shelters that there is a 250-page manual that's put out every year about how to use it. <laughs> so I think being able to say that your farm lost money every year is very important for a lot of people, and I think it's not not worth pointing out that also farms are the only businesses in the United States and in the world that uses cash accounting and not accrual accounting, which also allows to me to put a bunch of expenses for next year on my balance sheet this year to make sure that my income is negative, to make sure that I get the tax write-off, to offset maybe assets I'm, or income I'm earning from other places, right? Other investments or other work that I do. So there is a really good reason to make sure that your farm earns negative income every year. And I think every time I hear a, a net farm income is negative, that doesn't make any sense. And I don't know why we talk about it, but not enough people are educated in economics, I guess, is the answer. Yeah, I, I, would, I would point out, just as an aside, that the, the farm income calculation is a little different than the Schedule F calculation. And, 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 but, but it's a point well taken. OK, I do have another question before going to the audience. And that is um, another concern you hear, and is that um, the age of the farm operator is getting older and older. And I hear this not just here in the US, but you hear it in Europe. I just was with the EU Ag Commissioner last week, and he was talking about this. Jeff, tell me a little about, I mean, you, you know the, the NAS survey pretty well. Um, talk about that a little bit. Um, and then uh, I, what I'd like is also any sort of discussion maybe on en new entrants, because I think that is, there is, that's a different issue altogether about the aging, but people often point to the fact that we just don't have new farmers coming into it. But if you can talk a little about the succession and that sort of thing, that would be great. Yeah, so, so two things I would bring up is just to, to reinforce Vince's point that uh, people edge into farming. There are a lot of entryways into agriculture. It could come from uh, another career that's in an ag-related industry, maybe a lender. So those people don't necessarily enter in in their 20s. You know? so, so that's part of it. There is this increase in average age of, uh, generally it's quoted as the principal operator. And uh, USDA took a look at how they asked this question of who is the principal operator and decided to kind of throw it out in terms of uh, should there be a, a, a one person who is the head of the operation because they found uh, that oftentimes it was the oldest person who was acting as an operator on the farm. So now they asked uh, about all the operators on the farm without designating which one was the principal one. And they found that a lot of operators popped up in the 2017 data, including a record number of female operators. And um, the average age still stayed constant uh, relative to previous uh, censuses, but I think we are getting a more realistic uh, measure of who is the average person. We certainly got a lot more operators uh, when we asked the question differently. But it is... Uh, um, uh, an area of, of intense uh, research focus to look at barriers to entry into agriculture, look at financial barriers, look at uh, technological barriers and other sorts of structural barriers to try to understand, uh, you know, are there, are there things that are keeping people out of the sector? So. Great. Anybody else? Okay. I'm going to turn it over here. Raise your hand and we can get a microphone to you. Bert? Uh, thank you. Bert Ely. Uh, again, I'm looking at the, the chart up there um, on the pol second policy implications, which is, is, is very interesting because over, and that covers, uh, looks like almost a 30 year period. Fundamentally, we don't see significant change uh, in, in agriculture, particularly between 
you know, the large and medium sized versus the, the small farms and uh, all US households. My question is this, can we in the foreseeable future, whether through legislation or otherwise, really expect to see any significant change in direction or uh, are we seeing what it will turn out to be just a continuation of those same uh, pattern of change over the next few decades? Uh, to put the question another way, what, what kind of earthquake might strike agriculture that would really change things? Or in fact, is that earthquake uh, certainly unlikely to happen in the coming decades? I, Jim? I'm not sure we're reading the chart the same way. Uh, if I look, and this is just about incomes rather than lots of things are going on behind it. But if I look at that chart and fit a trend through, what I see is on average sharply rising incomes for operators of large and mid-sized farms. Uh, I think that's because within that group, production is shifting to larger and larger operations and they make more money. Um, I don't see anything on the horizon that, in my view, is going to change that trend in the next five to 10 years, because it's certainly been a powerful one for many past decades. Uh, I also, you know, the track for small farms is tricky because really, for many, many of those farms, that's people that own land. It's not, as we know, most of them aren't actually farming. Uh, so what do we expect to happen to the incomes over time of people that own land? They're relatively well-educated, relatively high-income people. I expect, I don't see anything that's going to turn that around. Yep. In that context, I think we know quite a lot. Now, agricultural economists often don't know very much, and Susan's shared that view with me more than once, and she's not wrong. But what we do know is that as labor prices, as the cost of labor has risen in a variety of areas, that has driven innovation that has led to the need for less labor managing every acre. And, and, and the different technologies are complex. Uh, they flowed into agriculture over a very long period of time. One of the most dramatic periods was between the 19, 1920 and 1935, when literally horses disappeared from, from, from crop farms, at least, and replaced by tractors. But we see all of these innovations that are continuing to exist. Uh, uh, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them driven by the increasingly substantial cost, in real terms, of hiring people to work on the farm, or opportunities for a farm owner in other sectors. There's this image often of farmers are not being very well educated. Complete fallacy. Uh, farmers, especially the large guys, are very well educated. Uh, some of them have more PhDs than, than some of us. Uh, this is a technologically sophisticated world now, and you can expect a lot of consolidation I think, as you have seen, just as Jim has suggested, there's a, there's a wrinkle here. And that is that when, when um, uh, I think, uh, uh, the, when, Kate, uh, when Kate showed the uh, number of farms, and you saw over several recent censuses, the number of farms had not changed. The interesting issue was why, and it's because, not because of uh, a growth necessarily in the number of large farms, but a growth in the number of very small farms, uh, what were referred to as hobby farms. Um, what I, in my part of the world, uh, two llamas and a cow might, or a horse might be the, the description uh, in, in attractive uh, venues. So it's very difficult to believe that this trend is not going to continue in one direction. But agriculture is complicated. It's not homogeneous. And you have young, bright people who want to get into, let's say, um, fruits and vegetables or very special specialty crops. And they come in and they're raising two acres of herbs or something like that. So 
But overall, the value of output is almost certainly going to be uh, more heavily located in these large farms over time, even if, as currently measured by USDA, the number of farms remains relatively stable. I've just thought of something, if I can jump oh, please. Sure. back in. If we're thinking about you know, potential big changes in the future, uh, I think there's a lot of interesting issues around IT and precision agriculture. Uh, Jess Lohenberg de Boer, formerly Purdue, now in the UK, who's a prominent expert on this, says that autonomous vehicles are there now and that there are no scale economies in them. What you do is, as you get bigger, you just get more of them. His argument, whether it's about autonomous vehicles in fields or robotic milkers in farms, is that they advantage smaller operations. We'll, we'll see whether that's going to be true. The alternative argument is that a great deal of what we're seeing with measurement and data collection and precision agriculture can reduce the local the advantages of localized knowledge and flexibility of family operations and allow you to manage a 200,000 acre farm from sitting in a city and having form and working for it. Those are two opposite views, by the way, of where IT and precision ag might drive farm structure. And I don't have I don't have a firm opinion on either one. I, I think the first one is here commercially. The second one is, I think, still in development. And those are, though, I think, things that might have major impacts on farm structure. Well, look, we're coming near the end. Any other questions? Yes. It's me again. Um, <laughs> Susan Offit. So uh, people in agriculture and on the Hill are not unaware of the criticism of the fact that uh, payments go to large operators, and these people are very wealthy. So every farm bill, we have a debate about limiting payments based on people's adjusted gross income. And currently, I think the limit is $900,000 or what. But maybe you could comment on um, the effectiveness of these um, lim payment limitations and the extent to which, oh, I wouldn't say they're window dressing, but the extent to which they really do affect the distribution of payments. Jump yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the question. And a distinction to make as well in response to the question is that we have payment limits for Title I, right, commodity program payments, uh, and for Title II conservation, although the Inflation Reduction Act has shifted that to, to individual, uh, with regard to individual payment limits. But crop insurance premium subsidies have no limit at all, right? And so that's something to note that when we're talking about subsidies for crop insurance, there are no federal limits. Uh, that's distinct from all other farm payments. On Title I commodity payments, the effectiveness of the enforcement of those payments, right, I think it's no secret, uh, and anyone here could elaborate, um, is not, uh, there, there are many loopholes, right? Uh, so I'm sure people in this room are familiar, but for those listening, one of the more common loopholes that I'm aware of are paper farms, right, where a farm is able to skirt around uh, the $125,000 limit per farm from commodity payment or $250,000 limit if you're with a spouse uh, by breaking your farm up on paper into many different farms so that each of those independent individual operations is able to receive that payment, right? Um, and so loopholes like that cast the effectiveness of those payment limits into doubt, as well as um, definitions surrounding who is actively engaged in farming and thus eligible for payments under commodity programs. Uh, the Trump administration, the previous administration, um, in their last few months finalized a rule to define those actively engaged in farming and thus eligible for these commodity payments uh, expanded who is eligible to include, right, cousins and nephews and nieces, et cetera. Um, so vastly, again, expanding who is eligible for these payments and thus reducing the effectiveness of congressional intent to create some kinds of means test about who is getting farmers to prevent, right, anyone getting $900,000 or above, so presumably millionaires and up from receiving government payments. Um, but please, if anyone here wants to elaborate. I think that about does it. Um, 
we're at the end, Vince. I'm going to let you talk a little about your uh, fact that this is the first of many seminars. Uh, this is the f well, thank, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first of five seminars that will deal with uh, important agricultural policy issues. Uh, we started with this subject because this is understanding what are the facts about farm income and the distribution of farm income, where farm income stands relative to uh, incomes of other households. We talk about farm household income. Uh, all of these issues are important and often misrepresented intentionally or accidentally in the policy debate. The next program will be on March 22nd, examining livestock regulation proposals, which are likely to feed into possible new regulations put forward within the Farm Bill, uh, uh, many of which um, are almost for, uh, involve certain industry advocates asking for policies that would shoot them metaphorically in the foot by damaging livestock revenues, incomes, and demand, and so on. Uh, we will then, uh, on April the 4th, have a session on the crop insurance program per se. Uh, all of the issues that surround crop insurance, whether or not it is good or bad for the environment, whether or not, as Billy has suggested, it's actually a risk transfer program, not a genuine risk of crop production, and revenues program uh, that benefits the community as a whole. Um, there are different views on that. And uh, then we will have one session on the link between agricultural R&D, climate change, and um, conservation policy. Uh, our final session will be on April the 28th, uh, sorry, April the 25th, uh, on Title I programs, the programs that do shovel considerable amounts of money based on production, whether through direct government payments, uh, as is the case with the uh, support programs that we've largely talked about, uh, and conservation programs, which the story is exactly the same, by the way, um, or we're talking about the sugar program which generates higher prices for consumers, or some of the, dairy, the, da the complex dairy program that leaves us all scratching our heads trying to understand what's going on. So we hope you all will follow those uh, programs, and thank you for being here to listen to this program or be in the room. Yeah, and thanks so much for all our guests on the second panel. This was great. Thanks.